Welcome to the City Council's November 16th Special City Council meeting. This is a teleconference meeting with the City Council and City staff participating in person and remotely, and members of the public participating remotely to ensure proper social Recording distancing. in progress. Thinking, thinking, thinking. So I have a motion on the floor by Vice Mayor Nash and a second by Mayor Combs to approve item C1 on our first consent calendar. Any further city council question or discussion? Seeing none by roll call vote, city council member Mueller. I, I'm, it might just be my computer, but um, much of the last, well, frankly, all of the city council meeting up until the point that you came on, city clerk Karen, was obscured in, in sort of a max headroom type echo. I don't know if other viewers at home are having that issue, uh, but I certainly did. I can go ahead and move forward with the motion uh, and vote yes, but wanted people to be aware that there was some sort of feedback taking place from within the room. Thank you, city council member Mueller. It is um, possible we might've been having some audio issues. So with that, I would like to maybe reopen public comment for our consent calendar um, in case that that option wasn't um, vocalized earlier. So we're gonna backtrack a little bit and I am going to, uh, through the mayor, reopen public comment for item C1, which is tonight's first consent item. So item C1 is to adopt a resolution adopting amendments to a previous resolution to continue conducting city council and advisory body meetings remotely 
and authorize the use of hybrid meetings. So if any member of the public wishes to speak on this item, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, you may press star nine now. So final call for public comment on item C1. And seeing no hands raised, Mayor Combs, you may continue. Okay, well then I, I think we can just repeat um, that uh, uh, Vice Mayor Nash moved approval of the consent calendar and I, I seconded it. Thank you, Mayor Combs. So there is a motion on the floor by Vice Mayor Nash and a second by Mayor Combs to approve the consent calendar, including item C1. Any further city council question or discussion? Seeing none by roll call vote, city council member Mueller. Yes. City council member Taylor. Yes. Vice Mayor Nash. Yes. Mayor Combs. Yes. And the motion passes with city council member Willison absent. Thank you. All right, thank you city court Karen. Um, with that, we'll move on to the public hearing portion of the meeting. This public hearing is a formal proceeding held in order to receive testimony from all interested parties on a proposed issue or action. Uh, tonight's public hearing, D1, consider the Planning Commission's recommendation and approve a general plan amendment and rezoning for a city stormwater pump station project at 1395 Chrysler Drive and uh, uh, 105 to 155 Constitution Drive. Um, here to introduce the item is Acting Principal Planner Tom Smith. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Uh, thank you for taking the time this evening to uh, hold the public hearing for this item. So I will share my screen. I have a brief presentation for you this evening. It appears I'm not able to share my screen at the moment. My apologies, Tom, try now. Okay. Great, thank you. So as the mayor mentioned, um, this is a general plan amendment and rezoning request for parcels at 1395 Chrysler Drive and 105 through 155 Constitution Drive. So you can see here uh, an overview of the project's location with the two parcels here. Um, 1395 Chrysler Drive is the parcel in blue. It's located near the intersection of Chrysler Drive and Bayfront Expressway. And it is the site of an existing um, city stormwater pump station that was constructed in 1958. And then the purple parcel that spans Constitution Drive between uh, Marsh Road and Chrysler Drive um, is the 105 through 155 Constitution Drive parcel, which is zoned M3X and is the site of two office buildings and two parking garages associated with the Menlo Gateway project. So the first request is a general plan amendment, and that would be to change the land use designation of approximately 3,600 square feet of a parcel at 105 through 155 Constitution Drive from commercial business park to public quasi-public. So you can see here, uh, that's the area of the parcel that's outlined in blue. And to change the land use designation of an approximately 3,600 square foot portion of the parcel at 1395 Chrysler Drive from public quasi-public to commercial business park. And so that's the portion here outlined in red. And there would be a portion of the existing pump station parcel that would remain public, quasi-public. The Planning Commission reviewed um, the general plan re amendment request at their November 1st meeting, and they did recommend approval. The second portion is a rezoning request, which would change the zoning um, of the portion of the parcel that would end up with the public quasi-public land use designation from M3X, which is uh, the commercial business um, 
designation to PF, which is Public Facilities Zoning District. So that's uh, the same portion of the parcel as, as uh, was, was described in the previous slide um, in blue. And then it would change the zoning of a portion of a parcel with the resulting commercial business park land use designation from PF to M3X. And so you can see that area again outlined here in red. And as with the general plan land use amendment, um, there would be a portion here of the existing pump station parcel that would remain PF zoning. The Planning Commission also reviewed this request at their November 1st meeting and recommended approval to the City Council. So in short, the, the combination of these two actions plus an administrative lot line adjustment um, would result in this parcel configuration. The pump station parcel would be here as outlined in blue, and then um, the remaining portion of the existing parcel shown here would become part of the Menlo Gateway parcel. And so um, you can see the effect of these changes before and after in the slides here. And just to give you an idea of, of the project for the new pump station itself, the existing building is um, a rather nondescript block building located here. And the proposed um, pump station building would be a larger facility and it would be set back further from the road. It also has uh, a unique metal skin that's a more geometric shape to it. And so for um, people driving into this area of the Bayfront uh, from this prominent intersection, it is a much more striking view than, than what they see currently when they turn onto Chrysler Drive. So the recommended actions this evening are to adopt a resolution that would approve the general plan land use amendment and adopt an ordinance to approve the rezoning, which would allow for a new pump station uh, with the following features. It would be capable of handling a 100 year storm event, whereas the, the current uh, pump station, as I mentioned, it was constructed in 1958. It's currently capable of handling, handling more like a 10 year storm event. So it's uh, critical for life and safety in this area of the city. It would also be set back further from Chrysler Drive for improved safety and access. And as I mentioned, it would offer better aesthetics at a major entrance to the Bayfront area. So with that, I will end my presentation and, and turn it back to the mayor. Thank you for the presentation, Mr. Smith. Um, let's go to a public comment. Thank you, Mayor Combs. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on item D1, Consider the Planning Commission's recommendation and approve a general planned amendment and rezoning for a city stormwater pump station project at 1395 Chrysler Drive and 105 through 155 Constitution Drive. Please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you are calling in from a landline or a cell phone, you may press star nine now. This will be the final call for public comment on our public hearing item. D1. And seeing no hands raised, Mayor Combs, you may continue. All right, thank you, uh, uh, City Clerk Heron. Um, a, a quick question: I was I was looking at the the sort of maps, and I'm sure, sure I got this wrong, and or it doesn't matter. But it seems like the new parcel is is sort of uh, landlocked, that it, it, in, and without any sort of uh, direct uh, frontage on the public right of way is 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 that accurate? Um, um, and if it is, uh, do we have any concerns about that? And if not, why? So that's a, a great question, Mayor. And if I may share my screen again, um, I can show you how that would work. There is a, a permanent access easement. Um, which I'm sharing my screen here. So there's a permanent access easement, which would grant us access to the site. Um, apologies for the very small size of the drawing, but here you can see, so just to give you an orientation, Chrysler Drive is running here and Bayfront Expressway would be along here. Um, 
the pump station itself would be constructed here. And then this area in gray would be the, the permanent access easement. So I think it's about 15 feet in width and uh, runs considerably far back behind uh, the building itself and would, would provide some parking area back here. And so, as I mentioned, that would be a permanent access easement to allow us to maintain the site as needed. All right, thank, thanks. Are there any other um, questions or comments from this city council? Does uh, Vice Mayor Nash? Where? I was going to um, move that we um, approve this um, project as written, or okay. um, the rezoning. Yeah, totally. And I just want to uh, um, mm, uh, officially cl close the public hearing, which I didn't do. So, so I, I'm going to do that. And then, and then now we, we have a, a, a motion, which is, um, you know, essentially to uh, uh, accept the Planning Commission's recommendation, improve the general plan amendment and rezoning for the city stormwater uh, pump station project at 1395 Chrysler Drive and 105 to 155 Constitution Drive. And uh, uh, Vice Mayor Nash made a motion and, and I'll, I'll, I'll second it, um, seeing no other um, comments from the city council. Thank you, Mayor Combs. So I have a motion on the floor by Vice Mayor Nash and a second by Mayor Combs. I just wanna get the wording of the recommendation into the motion here to approve the following entitlements related to a new city stormwater pump station to replace an existing pump station located at 1395 Chrysler Drive, formally addressed 1221 Chrysler Drive. Number one, general plan amendment to change the land use designation of an approximately 3,600 square foot portion of an existing approximately 8.9 acre parcel at 105 to 155 Constitution Drive from commercial business park to public quasi public and to change the land use designation of an approximately 3,600 square foot portion of an existing approximately 5,000 square foot parcel at 1395 Chrysler Drive from the public quasi public to commercial business park and number two, rezoning to change the zoning of a portion of the parcel with a resulting public quasi-public land use designation from M3X Commercial Business Park Conditional Development District to the PF Public Facilities District and to change the zoning of a portion of the parcel with a resulting commercial business park and land use designation from PF to M3X zoning. That encompasses the entirety of the motion. Uh, any further city council? Question or discussion? Seeing none by roll call vote, City Council Member Mueller. Yes. City Council Member Taylor. Yes. Vice Mayor Nash. Yes. Mayor Combs. Yes. And the motion passes with City Council Member Willison absent. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, City Clerk Heron. Uh, with that, we'll move on to uh, uh, the closed session. Uh, item and at his conference with legal counsel and anticipated uh, litigation. Um, and so, uh, uh, City Court Karen, can we call for, for, for public comment on the closed session item? Yes, thank you, Mayor Combs. So, at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on our closed session item E1, conference with legal counsel, anticipated litigation, significant exposure to litigation pursuant to paragraph two of subdivision D of government code section 54956.9, one case. Please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine now. So this will be the final call for public comment on our closed session item E1. And seeing no hands raised, Mayor Combs, you may continue. All right, thank you, City Clerk Heron. Um, with that, the City Council will adjourn to closed session and reconvene to the regular meeting immediately following the closed session. We are anticipating closed session to be one hour uh, long. And so uh, th that means we're hopefully back in chambers for regular session at 6.30.
Thank you all for your patience. Uh, having all of our city council members return to our dais. Mayor Combs, you may reconvene the meeting. Thank you, City Clerk Heron. I'd like to um, recall the meeting to order. Um, this is the regular November 16th City Council meeting. Uh, this is a teleconference, um, an in-person meeting with City, uh, uh, with City Council and City staff participating in person and remotely, and members of the public participating remotely to ensure proper social distancing in this federal, state, and local emergency. I'd like to reintroduce uh, staff and City Council members present, uh, Vice Mayor Betsy Nash, City Council members Ray Mueller, uh, and Cecilia Taylor, uh, Council Member Wilson is, is absent uh, for this meeting. Staff President include uh, City Manager Starla Jerome Robinson, City Attorney Nira Doherty, and City Clerk Judy Heron. Um, now we'll proceed on to uh, agenda review. Agenda review provides advance notice to members of the public and city staff of any modifications to the agenda order or any request uh, from City Council members under City Council member reports. Staff has requested that when the full city council has joined the meeting, we go into uh, item G1 as soon as practical. Uh, does the city council wish to pull um, or reorder any, any items on the agenda? Okay, um, seeing no, no requests uh, or indications of a desire to, to change the order of agenda items, um, we'll, uh, um, uh, have City Clerk Heron uh, give us instructions uh, to the City Council and members of the public on how the meeting will proceed. Thank you, Mayor Combs. So at this time, we do ask that the members of the City Council remain on screen for the duration of the meeting, engaging their own webcams and microphones. Staff will engage their webcams and microphones to make presentations or respond to any questions that the City Council may have. For members of the public, if you wish to speak on an item on tonight's agenda, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, you can press star nine. And that does conclude my introductions at this time. Thank you. All right, thank you, City Clerk Heron. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce City Attorney Nira Doherty to report out from closed session. Thank you. I have a reportable action from the November 9th 2021 city council meeting. At that council meeting, the city approved and has since reached a final settlement agreement in the lawsuit titled Save Our Menlo Park Neighborhoods versus City of Menlo Park, case number 21 CIV 01717. The settlement, settlement agreement provides that within 45 days, the city council will consider modifications to the Sharon Road sidewalk project. The modifications to be considered are a raised concrete sidewalk with a maximum width of five feet on the north side of Sharon Road between Alameda de las Pulgas and Actual Avenue and a, sh and a shift in the center line of the section of Sharon Road between those two streets south of no more than one foot. If the council approves the project modifications, petitioners will dismiss the lawsuit with preju prejudice. Uh, thank you, City Attorney Doherty, for that report out. Um, with that, we'll, we'll turn to uh, the study session. Study sessions are an opportunity for City Council staff to introduce an item that will require policy direction from the City Council in the near future. City staff will provide a brief presentation. I will then call for public comment. After public comment, the City Council will discuss the matter interactively with staff. The City Council will not take an action on items addressed in study sessions. <clears throat> The City Council may provide direction to City staff for preparation of additional analysis or information necessary when the item returns to the City Council for action. Um, the study session item uh, for the evening is K1, provide direction on development of an ordinance to regulate wireless facilities on private property and in the public right away. Uh, here to introduce the item is Public Works Director Nikki Nagaya. Great. Thank you, Mayor Combs, members of the council, and Nikki Nagaya, Public Works Director, and we'll have a brief presentation on the study session item tonight. 
Give me one second to get the presentation loaded. There we go. I think you should be, all be able to see my screen now. Um, so I will be joined tonight with uh, Denise Bazzano from the city attorney's office, and we'll give a, a very brief overview of that, the item before you. Um, so in short, we'll be presenting uh, on wireless communication facilities in the city. So the requested direction tonight is to direct staff uh, to develop an ordinance regulating wireless communication facilities. Sorry, I'm having some technical trouble on my end, but I think you can all see this, so that should be good. Um, so essentially, the, the need for this ordinance stems from um, the lack of, of specific regulations in the city's current municipal code. Uh, so there are two sections that we'll reference. Um, chapter 16 uh, requires use permits for wireless facilities on private property. And then there's a section in chapter 13 that outlines procedures for construction in the public right of way. Uh, it's called an encroachment or an encroachment permit, uh, but there's not a specific section on any regulations for wireless facilities um, uh, themselves. And so in a moment, I'll, I'll turn over to the city attorney's office to explain some of the existing regulatory and, and legal framework where the city uh, may not have authority to regulate these facilities, but in short, um, any kind of development or aesthetic regulations, application procedures are not currently codified in, in the city's um, municipal code today. So on public right of way, we've adapted our current encroachment permit procedures to review at installations when they come forward. Um, but we see a need for a clearer framework um, so that we can kind of work with applications as they come in um, through a code section that, that gives more clarity around the regulations, where we have control and where we don't um, for, for purposes of, of processing these, these applications. So with that, I will turn it over to Denise, who's gonna talk about some of the legal framework for these facilities. Thank you, Director Nagaya. Denise Bazzano, Assistant City Attorney here on behalf of the City Attorney's Office. So I'm just gonna to touch on some of the uh, applicable federal law that affects wireless regulations. Um, as many of you know, the Telecommunications Act of 1996 establishes much of the federal framework for wireless communications. The act and other laws enacted by Congress and those uh, regulations adopted by the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, as well as state law really limit what the city can do in terms of regulating wireless communications facilities. The staff report provides a more, more detailed information about uh, the relevant federal and state law and other recent legal decisions, but I do want to touch upon a few key areas of federal law that are typically discussed when drafting or, or um, discussing options relating to wireless local wireless regulations and areas where the city is largely preempted from regulating. So as you can see on the slide, the first area that we're gonna discuss is radio frequency or RF emissions. The act prohibits the city from regulating on the basis of environmental impacts, which include potential or perceived health effects from RF emissions. Moreover, the act prohibits the city from regulating the placement, construction, and modification of personal wireless service facilities on the basis of those environmental effects of radio frequency emissions to the extent that such facilities comply with the, the Federal Communications Commission's regulations concerning those emissions. So while there are a number of people that question whether these types of facilities are safe, the federal government, particularly the FCC, has determined that these facilities are generally safe if operated within standards set by the FCC. As a result of this federal preemption in this area of the law, cities, local governments, counties generally 
limit their role in the area of RF emissions to requiring only evidence of compliance with the FCC RF emission standards as part of the approval process. The second key area that's on the slide there is uh, effective prohibition of services and, and what constitutes an effective prohibition of services is, uh, is a topic of recent decision by the FCC. In 2018, the FCC issued a declaratory ruling and order relating to small wireless facilities. In that declaratory ruling and order, the FCC affirmed their interpretation of what constitutes an effective prohibition of services under the act. And basically they found that, that the, um, sorry, I lost my place, that anything that if effective prohibition is anything that materially, any regulation that materially limits or inhibits the ability of a carrier from competing in a fair and balanced legal and regulatory environment. That's pretty broad. Um, they, uh, FCC opined and the Ninth Circuit in the case of City of Portland versus FCC also uh, affirmed the FCC's decision that, you know, this effective prohibition of services means that local regulations cannot prohibit a carrier from, from doing things um, that promote their business. So they can't, cities can't prohibit a carrier from densifying its network introducing new services or improving its service capabilities. The FCC's, as I mentioned, the FCC's interpretation of what constitutes an effective prohibi prohibition of services basically resolved um, some conflicting decisions in the court. And as I mentioned, the Ninth Circuit upheld the FCC's interpretation of what an effective prohibition of services is. So, Ultimately, cities and counties cannot impose regulations that would constitute that effective prohibition of services. The third key area that we're going to discuss uh, in terms of federal regulation is the time for review and approval of applications for wireless facilities. This is critical when cities receive applications, they need to process those applications and come to a decision either to approve or deny the application within what the timeframes that have been established by the FCC as presumptively reasonable timeframes. The shot clocks vary depending on the type of facility or application um, that, the, that is involved, but they are generally very short timeframes. These shot clocks can be extended through mutual tolling agreement with the carrier, but the carrier is not required to agree to an extension through a tolling agreement. So for example, a small wireless facility on a new structure, the FCC has determined uh, and set the shot clock to be a 90 day period. The city would have to accept that application review its contents and any of the documents that are submitted with the application, so such as plans, um, reports, et cetera, within that 90 days. Additionally, the 90 day, the shot clock periods, whatever the, the period may be, also include any applicable hearings or appeal processes um, and any agreements that would need to be um, a, formed for the application. So if the facility is proposed to be on a city poll, for example, the city would need to enter into the applicable agreement with the carrier within that shot clock period. Finally, consistent treatment of all carriers. Under the act, the city cannot discriminate among providers of functionally equivalent services. So for example, the city could not apply different processes or standards to AT&T that it applies to Verizon. And the city could not discriminate against one carrier over the other. As discussed in the staff report, um, so in addition to these federal key areas of, of preemption, there are other uh, laws. There are state statutes regulating wireless facilities. Most significantly is the Public Utilities Code Section 7901, which grants providers a franchise right to construct facilities in the public right of way. The city can impose permitting requirements 
As Director Nagaya mentioned, there are encroachment permits required for uh, the uh, facilities in the public right of way, and that's totally acceptable under Public Utilities Code Section 7901. The city can also impose reasonable aesthetic requirements over these facilities in the public right of way, but the city has very little ability to deny these types of applications for facilities in the right of way. And so many jurisdictions provide in the regulatory process a ministerial approval to streamline the review of these types of facilities in the public right of way. For those facilities that are installed in the right of way on poles owned by a public agency, such as the city, many jurisdictions have included in their regulations a requirement that the carrier enter into a master license agreement to help streamline the process and meet those shot clock requirements under the federal law. So as indicated in the staff report, the city has been uh, approached by various carriers for uh, to enter into an into a master license agreement. And um, as I mentioned, that is a method to streamline the review and approval process. So now I will turn it back over to Director Nagaya to finish the presentation. Okay, thank you, Assistant City Attorney Bozzano uh, for that overview. So just a, uh, a few wrap up slides here to go. Um, so as was just mentioned, um, some of the options for consideration uh, for the council to, to think about as part of the study session tonight include um, the potential for a template master license agreement. And so that could provide a basic framework that we would work with carriers uh, to put in place on their specific requests. And so as you heard from the the description of the shot clocks and the time that we need to process applications, that template agreement could be critical in, in allowing us to, to meet those timelines as we go forward with, with processing any of these applications. Um, secondly, uh, the potential for adoption of an ordinance that outlined the objective criteria we can use to process applications, um, the, the procedure, the permitting process, the uh, aesthetic and design criteria that we would use to, to review applications and hold um, them to those standards in, in the ordinance uh, is another option for the council to consider. So with those two options, then um, we are also tracking uh, the potential for uh, some resource needs for staff to, to move forward with um, this item. Uh, I think it, in particular is a, a request for a budget for consultant support. And we're at, at this point in time, our initial estimates would be uh, support in the order of magnitude of $25,000. Uh, depending on the council direction tonight, we can bring that back with the mid-year budget uh, that would be up for the council consideration uh, as part of your December uh, 7th meeting, uh, the, the next regular meeting. So finally, just to reiterate, um, we're requesting direction as part of the study session tonight uh, to develop an ordinance regulating these wireless communication facilities. With that, we'll happily take any questions uh, from the council for this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nagaya. Um, City Clerk Heron, let's call for public comment on this item. Thank you, Mayor Combs. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on our study session item K1, provide direction on development of an ordinance to regulate wireless facilities on private property and in the public right of way, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine now. And our first speaker will be Richard Hackman. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Great. I hope you all are doing well tonight. My name is Richard Hackman, and I'm a consultant for AT&T. I'm here tonight to express AT&T's excitement and appreciation that the City Council is taking time to look further into small cell issues. Small cell infrastructure is of critical importance to our society, especially in light of the remote work and education that is now required as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Due to the critical importance of small cell infrastructure, AT&T is interested in entering into a master license agreement or MLA with the city of Menlo Park. A MLA would establish the terms and conditions for AT&T to install small cell equipment on city assets in the public right of way, such as street lights, following the city's approval for AT&T to do so. Also with us here tonight is Tom Schuler, a senior real estate and construction manager for AT&T. Tom is happy to answer as many of your questions as he can, should you have any for AT&T. Thank you for your time and again, we appreciate you spending time on this important issue tonight. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker will be Michael Citron. Hello there, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Hello, honorable council members. My name is Michael Citron. I am Crown Castle's Northern California Permitting Manager. I applaud the city and its efforts to update and streamline its ordinance and design guidelines to comply with state and federal law and facilitate robust next generation, high speed broadband internet services in your community. Thank you for your time and we look forward to continuing to work with the city. Thank you for your comment. So this will be the final call for public comment on our study session item K1. And seeing no further hands raised, Mayor Combs, you may continue. All right, thank you, City of Cork Heron. Um, bringing it back to the dais, um, is there anyone on council who would like to kick off uh, questions or discussions um, on this item? Is it possible to put back on the screen the, the slide where we're specifically asking for council action? Um, uh, council member Mueller. Yeah, I mean, my, I dealt with this issue last year uh, with a family and, and I, I, um, I had an issue where I mean, candidly, the, the facilities are being placed in a residential neighborhood I mean, right next to a, a driveway. And we tried to work with the applicant to try to get them to move it to a non-residential area uh, and specifically looking for like high traffic volume area like uh, El Camino Real or Sand Hill Road and really found, uh, found that they weren't uh, willing to do so. And so I'm kind of curious, what, what ability do we have then to try to get, to try to move these, to try to get these facilities placed uh, in areas that just aren't so immediately adjacent to a person's home? Uh, thank you, Mayor Combs. Um, thank you for the, the question, Councilmember Mueller. And yes, we remember very, very much the, the family I think that you're you're referencing. Um, we worked with earlier uh, earlier this year. Um, I think in that particular case, and, and many of these installations, the city doesn't have much discretion in terms of where we can permit them. There are some um, kind of basic considerations that I think we can provide in terms of proximity to some uh, schools, uh, other public facilities, but in terms of a blanket restriction in residential neighborhoods, uh, that's not something that I, I've, um, I think is, is allowed under the, the FCC order. Mr. Guy, sort of following up, would this ordinance provide the city with any more authority um, in that situation uh, than it currently has? Yeah, so I think the, the main thing um, that an ordinance would have allowed in, in that particular case is um, kind of twofold. One is a, a clear process for the, any kind of public review. And so uh, the encroachment permit process right now is 
uh, is ministerial in nature. And so there, there was not as much um, notification, I think, to the homeowner that was potentially affected uh, in that particular case. And so um, adopting an ordinance would allow us to outline sort of that public engagement and, and re public review process. And then it could also um, provide some more clarity around um, the, the aesthetic treatments that, that we could require as part of a, an application review. So in that particular case, um, the equipment was located on a pole um, that was closer to the home. And so uh, we could outline some criteria where um, uh, just how it's oriented on the pole itself uh, could be slightly different to help screen it from, from the homeowner as opposed to screen it from the public right of way view. So I think those are the two kind of items within that particular application that, that we could have um, potentially done a little bit differently if we had uh, regulations in place. Councilmember Mueller, did you have an additional follow-up? I know I cut cut in there. Yeah, I just I know other jurisdictions have been more aggressive in this area. Um, I appreciate, you know, I always appreciate our professional staff. And I know it's a it's a very tough situation to be in. Um, I would lean toward wanting to be more aggressive in this area in terms of the residential neighborhoods and the distance from homes. Uh, but uh, I don't know where my colleagues are on that. Uh, and I don't know. I mean, I don't, I, I do think, um, I'm, I'm not, it's not to say I'm not saying they can't be in the city anywhere. I think there are commercial locations, high traffic locations that we could sort of make accommodation, but if there was a way that we could look at at a, at a map and try to figure out uh, those places where there'd be minimal impact on residential neighborhoods, I, I do think, regardless of um, regardless of, of where some of these, well, regardless, I think that there is significant em enough community concern that if there was a way that we could sort of try to accommodate that while at the same time not impacting service, it would be, it would be something that would be beneficial to residents. All right, thanks Council Member Mueller, Vice Mayor Nash. So I would certainly be, um, join you in those thoughts. I would like it to be something that's applied equally citywide so that um, regardless of it, of, whether neighbors are um, more engaged or not, that they have equal um, coverage with the, whatever regulations we have. And I'm very curious um, from legal what the, if, there, if this is possible and um, how aggressive we can be, or is that something that we decide as we're going through the ordinance? So this is Denise Bazzano, I'll respond to that. Um, there, so as I mentioned, the city cannot impose any regulation that would be an effective prohibition of service. So sometimes distance requirements result in effective prohibition of services because, or, or zoning um, restrictions result in an effective prohibition of services because if you say that carriers can't um, implement their facilities in residential areas, then you may be ultimately preventing them from expanding their service line or um, densifying their network or providing more services to a new area of coverage. So that type of regulation, we have to be very cautious with, but I know in some jurisdictions, they have adopted regulations that outline preferences, locational preferences um, that outline where the council would like these uh, facilities to be located, you know, in order of preference and encourage carriers to look at that preference list when deciding where to locate their facility. 
So, you know, in some jurisdictions, they'll have commercial areas first, and then industrial areas, and then last on the list would be residential areas. Usually these preferences are just that, they're preferences, so they wouldn't be any type of regulation that the cities would enforce, but it gives the cure an idea of how the city council has determined they would like these facilities to be rolled out in their jurisdiction. Um, thank you, Assistant City Attorney Balzano for the, those comments. Um, so it seems like either way that we, we start with the ordinance, right? um, uh, th that's a process that needs to be engaged in um, you know, first, right before before we sort of get to um, how aggressive we can or, or can't be or, or you know, how, how we're going to um, uh, construct uh, you know, our, our desire to see uh, these facilities placed in, in certain areas or, or certain areas considered first. Um, so uh, what, um, Ms. Uh, Nagaya, Ms. Banzano, can you so, sort of go with me and, and let's the exact sort of direction you're, you're looking for? Um, it seems like obviously there's support with moving forward with drafting an ordinance. Um, so what other sort of um, direction do, do you need? Yeah, thank you, Mayor Combs. Um, so essentially, I think that was the main thing is, is confirming that the direction to proceed with the ordinance. Um, so we wanted to bring that forward to you before um, we started uh, staff work in earnest. And, and with that direction, um, if you so choose to see us move forward, then we would look to bring forward first a budget request on December 7th as part of the, the mid-year budget review. And then um, once that's in place, we would start the process of, of procuring a, a technical consultant that could assist uh, Public Works and the Community Development Department with development of, kind of the uh, framework for those objective uh, standards and regulations that, that we mentioned earlier. And then we'd be on our way to, to developing the ordinance. So we don't have a specific time frame proposed uh, as part of the item tonight, but we wanted to, to confirm the direction uh, to proceed with the ordinance development before uh, just bringing it forward for, for your review. Thanks for that. And so when this, I, I know that this will sort of come as a budget item. So when outside of that instance, what will this agenda item look like when council sees this next? Will, will it be uh, like a draft or will it be looking for some further direction? Um, like what, what, I'm just trying to get some sense of when this comes back to us um, outside of, again, the, the financial component, what, what, what state will it be in? Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, in terms of, of the review procedure, um, any kind of change to the zoning code would typically take that to the planning commission. So there would be kind of a step for review with the, the planning commission, as well as uh, coming back to the council. Um, so I think um, what, what we'd like to do is um, identify some, some technical support assistance from the consultant and then start to scope out I think those specific reviews um, and, and the timeline for, for which you would see this again and in what nature. I think based on the feedback tonight, I, I could see some value for sure in, in bringing back um, certainly a draft ordinance for your review uh, prior to any sort of introduction um, at, at this point, um, knowing that there, there's likely going to be um, a lot of interest in the topic and, and the placement of the facilities it will be a, a, a critical kind of aspect to, to the development of the ordinance. But I think we just need some um, technical expertise and, and support to, to outline a specific process and then we can um, schedule that for, for the council. Well, well thanks. I, I think, yeah, I certainly think you, you have the direction you need to, to proceed. Um, and so unless there's any other comments, um, so Vice Mayor Nash. So I'd like to um, just make sure that we loop in or 
that the consultant loops in as they're proceeding. Um, first of all, any best practices from neighboring cities, any best practice from our um, city attorney's firm and make sure that we're um, sort of balancing being aggressive in this as much as we can and um, not making it, doing it in as quickly as possible with as little um, staff resources. So it's sort of a balance with getting it exactly perfect for Menlo Park versus getting something on the books so we can make sure that we're, um, have these regulations going forward. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Vice Mayor Nash. Well, well, thank you, Ms. Nagaya and Ms. Bonzano for the, um, um, you know, for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. All right, with that, we'll proceed to the public comment portion of the meeting. Under public comment, the public may address the city council on any subject not listed on the agenda. Each speaker may address the city council once under public comment for a limit of three minutes. Please clearly state your name and address our political jurisdiction in which you live. The city council cannot act on items not listed on the agenda, and therefore the city council cannot respond to non-agenda issues brought up under public comment other than to provide general uh, information. Uh, city Clerk Karen, can you call for uh, general public comment? Yes, thank you, Mayor Combs. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on an item not on tonight's agenda, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine now. And our first speaker will be Amy Rolliter. Hi, yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, Amy went to choir, so this is her husband. We live at, uh, on Durham Street in the Willows. And um, we just wanted to say to um, please vote to accept the EQC recommendation and uh, to please pass an ordinance to ban gas powered leaf blowers. There, we find them very noisy, highly polluting, and not necessary since electric leaf blowers are widely available and already being used in neighboring cities. So that's it. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, and I will go ahead and add this public comment to item N1, and we will continue public comment for any related um, gap, leaf gas blowers or EQC recommendations for N1. So is there any further public comment for an item not on tonight's agenda? Please engage that hand feature or press star nine if calling in. Seeing none, Mayor Combs, you may continue. Thank you, City Court Karen. Um, okay, with that, we'll move on to our, our second consent calendar of the evening. Under the consent calendar, the city council may take action to approve routine business items in one motion, unless a city council member, city staff member, or a member of the public request that an item be discussed or continue to a later date. Um, city Clerk Karen, can you uh, call for public comment on uh, uh, this consent calendar? Yes, thank you, Mayor Combs. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on our consent calendar, which only consists of item M2, regarding the solid waste recyclables and organic waste disposal ordinance. Please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, press star nine. So this will be the final call for public comment on our consent calendar consisting of item M2. Seeing none, Mayor Combs, you may continue. All right, thank you. Um, City Court hearing, uh, bringing it back to the virtual and real dais. Um, uh, are there any comments or questions or, or motions related to the consent calendar? Uh, Council Member Taylor. Thank you, Mayor Combs. I'll make a motion to approve um, the consent calendar for the agenda item M2. All right, thank you. I'll, I'll second. Thank you. 
So I have a motion on the floor by city council member Taylor and a second by Mayor Combs to approve the consent calendar of item M2. Any further city council question or discussions? Seeing none by roll call vote, city council member Mueller? Yes. City council member Taylor? Yes. Vice Mayor Nash? Yes. Mayor Combs? Yes. And the motion passes with city council member Willison absent. Thank you. Uh, thank you, City Clerk Karen. We'll move now to the regular business portion of the meeting. Under regular business, the City Council considers recommendations from City staff on policy matters or administrative actions that require City Council approval. Um, the first item under regular business is N1, receive annual report from the Environmental Quality Commission, approve the Commission's annual work plan, and approve direction on the Commission's recommendations regarding banning gas powered leaf blowers. Um, here to present the item is a sustainability manager, Rebecca Lucky. Good evening, Mayor Combs and council members. I'm going to start my slideshow here. Um, I first wanted to just acknowledge that I, I send apologies from the chair and the vice chair. They had um, a scheduling conflict that came up and so they're unable to attend um, the meeting tonight and, and present their progress report for this year. But they um, you know, were comfortable with wanting to get the work plan considered by the environmental, uh, by the city council and also for you to hear their advice about um, a leaf blower policy. And I do have an environmental quality commissioner here. Commissioner Elkins is here who um, has been um, part of the, the subcommittee of one on the leaf blower policy advice to the EQC, the Environmental Quality Commission. And I'm Rebecca Lucky, the sustainability manager. Um, and I will give you an overview of the commission work plan and their highlights for this year and then um, go into the leaf blower advice. So the Environmental Quality Commission, a bit of background, there are seven members appointed by the city council. They serve a, a four-year term for up to two terms. They advise the city council on environmental sustainability topics as referred by the city council to the commission and also through the annual commission work plan that is approved by the city council. They also make determinations on heritage tree appeals and they're supported by a staff liaison, which is myself, the sustainability manager. So a summary of their proposed 2022 work plan for, for consideration of approval by the city council tonight is that they are um, seeking to continue to provide support on the six climate action plan strategy goals, as well as future goals to reach carbon neutrality by 2030. They're also working on urban canopy preservation, green and sustainable, sustainable initiatives uh, like pollutants, water conservation, waste management. They are uh, also were um, at the advice of city council looking at and reviewing a gas powered leaf blower ordinance as it was referred by, um, by you in early 2021. Some of the highlights, they've been a very busy commission all year long, as you know. So in February, um, well, so I, I should say in January, it's not on this slide, but they did um, work very hard to put this work plan together that's attached to the staff report. They were working on that um, in 2020 toward the end of the year and did approve of it in January. And then it was updated in, um, in May to incorporate the leaf blower referral by the city council. And so from that point in January, they really launched into the work. In February, they reviewed the EV electric vehicle infrastructure gap analysis, and they recommended additional outreach to multifamily property owners in May. Um, and then they updated in September, um, additional climate action plan goals and strategies to reach carbon neutrality by 2030. And that was received by the council on October 12th. In August, they reviewed the cost effectiveness and policy options analysis for existing buildings um, to electrify them and gave advice to the city council on policy and programs. And in September, they uh, did um, form a recommendation about advising a ban on gas powered leaf blowers, which I'll talk about in the next slide. And in October, uh, they recommended approval of vehicle purchase 
purchases that included a patrol Tesla pilot program for the police department. And they also um, recommended approval of a climate resiliency adaptation position for this fiscal year that'll be coming to council um, next month. So a summary of the commission's advice regarding leaf blowers. I, this is a, a summary. There was a lot of context. Um, there is also a memo that's attached to the, um, the staff report on the commission's rationale and um, review and research on the matter. So the EQC is recommending that the C city council consider bans on gas powered leaf blowers done by neighboring cities to avoid reinventing the wheel. And that uh, time and resources spent on this issue um, shouldn't detract from those resources already dedicated to the climate action plan implementation. So the recommendation for you tonight on this agenda item is to receive and file the annual report from the commission included in the staff report analysis section and approve the commission's annual work plan for 2022 and um, potentially provide direction on the commission's recommendation regarding banning gas powered leaf blowers in the, in the staff report due to it includes a couple of options if the council would like to consider um, moving forward with a gas powered leaf blower ban right away. Um, and we do um, see that, you know, this is a, a, a desire by the community. Uh, there are um, issues that we're still working through it and figuring out enforcement on that uh, front um, to make sure that we're meeting the expectations of the city council and the community in, in moving this forward. With that, that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lucky. Um, city Clerk Heron, can we call for public comment? Yes, thank you, Mayor Combs. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on item N1, receive annual report from the EQC, approve the commission's annual year work plan, and provide direction on the commission's recommendation regarding banning gas powered leaf blowers, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine now. And our first speaker will be Davil Axelrod. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to comment on the proposed ban of the use of gas powered leaf blowers in Menlo Park. Uh, my name is David Axelrod. I'm a Menlo Park resident and a faculty pediatrician, specifically a pediatric cardiologist at Stanford. And I'll offer my personal views on the health related hazards of gas powered leaf blowers for all Menlo Park residents, but especially for our kids. Um, decades of rigorous scientific research has taught us that pollution and environmental exposures disproportionately affect our children. And my training in pediatrics and my current practice in the pediatric intensive care unit provides me a constant reminder of why this is the case. And that's because babies and children breathe faster than adults. They inhale a larger volume of air when indexed to their body weight. And they spend more time at or near ground level when they're crawling, walking, or sitting where many of the environmental toxins settle. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, children's developing lungs, hearts, and brains are uniquely sensitive to environmental exposures as they mature. There are two negative health effects of the use of gas powered um, leaf blowers that I'd like to highlight briefly. Um, one is air pollution, both from dust or particulate matter and chemicals. And then the second is noise pollution. First for air pollution, gas powered leaf blowers combust a mixture of oil and gasoline. And unlike cars have no exhaust filter or catalytic converter. The emissions contain carcinogens such as uncombusted gasoline, benzene, formaldehyde, and ozone. And for reference, these can release 300 times as much hydrocarbon as some cars and trucks. Regarding particulate air pollution, all leaf blowers, both gas powered and, and even electric, work by propelling particulate matter into the air. And with air speeds as high as 200 miles an hour, they send dust into the air and into kids' lungs that contains everything from brake lining powder that is settled on road services, surfaces to chemicals such as herbicides, microscopic dirt particles, and others. And the particulate matter damages lungs. It's harmful for everyone today and deleterious for decades for the developing lungs of our kids. Secondly, noise pollution. The motors in the, in the leaf blowers emit about 100 decibels of low frequency noise, where 85 decibels is considered often dangerous. And research demonstrates that this noise increases blood pressure and the risk of heart attack and stroke and impairs development and learning in children and increases stress hormones like cortisol. 
can also disrupt critically important sleep when it passes through windows and walls, even at a distance of 100 feet away. I do appreciate that there are important economic, political, and societal implications of imposing an immediate ban on uh, gas power leaf blower use. And I'm not an expert in these areas, but I will submit that this ban will also help protect the health of the gardeners, workers, and citizens that are using the leaf blowers and inhaling the gas and particulate matter as they work. They too need protection from these environmental toxins. I'm proud to support the submitted uh, written testimony or commentary from my fellow citizens, many of them who are physicians and experts in child health, in urging us to lead to an immediate ban of the use, not just the sale of gas powered leaf blowers in Menlo Park. It's our duty, and in fact, a mandate for our city to protect our children. And banning the use of gas powered leaf blowers is one small step that will put us on the right side of history. Thanks very much. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker will be Jeffrey Hook. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Thank you, uh, members of the city council for giving me the opportunity to speak to this issue. Um, your forebears or people who, uh, the city council in 1998 actually had the foresight to ban gas powered leaf blowers. And at the time, the Gardeners Association vigorously opposed it and launched a refer referendum that was successful in overturning the ban. But the situation is different now. And that same organization, the Bay Area Gardeners Association, now supports transition away from gas powered blowers. The technology has changed. And I think our our sense of urgency re regarding health and climate issues has changed as well. So it's way past due that we address this issue and do the right thing that your previous council did uh, over 20 years ago. Um, many other cities are jumping on board. We've got San Jose, uh, council member, member Matt Mann, he's excited to get this program off the road. It's a clearly a common sense initiative, great for the environment, our health and our neighborhood quality of life. You have bands in Portola Valley that went into effect earlier this year. The city is much quieter. We've got Belvedere, Mill Valley, uh, Alameda, Oakland, Palo Alto has got a ban and we're talking about enforcing it there. Uh, Al Mandel, a member of the Hayward Planning Commission voted four to three recently to outlaw their use in residential areas. He calls it a convenience for one person that inconveniences a hundred others. That's not a good trade-off. Um, as the previous speaker uh, elucidated much better than I can, the pollution from these devices is, poses quite a, a, a public health hazard, uh, especially to the operators. And it's time that we, uh, we you know, came to our senses and banned these, these blowers. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker will be Elliot Crane. I apologize. I was. Oh, we were able to hear you for a moment. So we're calling for Elliot Crane. There, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. I, I apologize. Um, my name is Elliot Crane. I, like Dr. Axelrod, I'm a faculty member at Stanford University in the Department of Pediatrics and the Department of Anesthesiology. And I want to direct my comments primarily to the health effects of gas-powered leaf blowers. Um, the first thing I would uh, highlight is the noise pollution. I've spoken to the council before about the noise pollution regarding Caltrain noise, so some of my comments may be, to, may be familiar to some, but I want to say that in the case of gas-powered leaf blowers, their sound emission is approximately 100 decibels in proximity to the leaf blower. These 100 decibels are largely low frequency noise, which means they penetrate walls and windows very well and can actually exceed levels of 60 or 70 decibels, even as much as 100 feet away. 
this exceeds the ocean limits for workplaces and and our children and and uh, residents are being exposed to this uh, sound uh, almost continuously through the course of the day. The noise pollution has adverse health effects on children and adults alike. Most importantly, increased cardiovascular disease and mortality, such as high blood pressure, heart attacks, and strokes. It causes learning impairment and attention disabilities in children. And of course, it increases psychological stress, as many of you I'm sure have experienced, with secondary cardiovascular, neurological, and psychological effects. I want to emphasize also that the individuals who are most at risk for the adverse effects are not the citizens of Menlo Park, but rather the landscapers and gardeners themselves who operate the equipment for hour upon hour every day of the week and often not wearing ear protection. Gas powered leaf blowers uh, emit tremendous amount of toxic exhaust, as Dr. Axelrod pointed out. I want to um, highlight a study that has been widely quoted and cited by the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal a few years ago, a study done in 2011, which compared a 50cc two-stroke leaf blower and a Ford F-150 pickup truck, Raptor, the latter containing a six liter, 400 horsepower engine. Each were run for 30 minutes while measuring the pollutant output. The hydrocarbon emissions um, from operating the gas-powered leaf blower for only 30 minutes were the equivalent of driving the Ford 150 pickup truck for nearly 4,000 miles. Other studies have been less impressive in their results, but no less, imp less important. Gas-powered leaf blowers release basically 300 times the level of hydrocarbons as vehicles, and running one for one hour is, generally speaking, equivalent to the pollution of an automobile driving 1,100 miles. This is far from trivial. They also create a tornado of wind that approaches 200 miles per hour at their, at their exit point. And this propels particulate pollution into the air, including toxins from the streets, such as automobile brake dust, which contains, which contains um, asbestos, and landscaping chemicals such as herbicides, pathogens such as, such as fungi and their spores, and inert microscopic particles of soil that penetrate deep into the lungs, creating respiratory complications, as Dr. Axelrod pointed out, both in young children, but also increase the severity of chronic lung disease in the elderly. Again, the individuals most at risk for are the landscape workers who work in proximity to these exhausts for eight or 10 hours a day. The city, in my view, has a duty to protect the health of its residents, but also the health of its workforce and visitors. And a pernicious phenomenon that damages everyone's health today is noise, chemical pollution, and dust created by gas-powered leaf blowers. Now, banning these blowers and allowing leaves to decompose benefits the local ecology by returning to rake and broom, but returning to rake and broom will certainly increase the cost to homeowners paying landscaping crews to groom their property by increasing the time required to complete the job. But the community cost to homeowners pales in comparison to the societal cost of the mental and physical health effects of exposure to noise and air pollution from these leaf blowers. I will be the first in line to pay my gardening service more for the work that they do. I join my fellow citizens in urging an immediate ban of gas-powered leaf blowers in Menlo Park. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker is Carlos Myers Asenicio. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. All right. Uh, good afternoon, honorable council members. My name is Carlos Mars Asensio and I live on 2070 Monterey Avenue, Menlo Park. Uh, firstly, I wanna thank you for your time and consideration. Uh, I'm, I came here today to urge your administration to ban the sale and use of gas powered leaf blowers in Menlo Park in accordance with the Environmental Quality Commission's recommendation. Uh, as a 15 year old in the midst of a climate crisis, I worry about my future every day. That is why I believe any step to miti mitigate climate change, especially local as we see here, is a step in the right direction. Leaf blowers and small off-road engines alike emit a large amount of harmful pollutants, which as previously mentioned, uh, are very detrimental to teenagers like me, uh, create noise pollution you can hear from blocks away, uh, and are simply unnecessary in the present age. Simple alternatives like rakes or even just letting the leaves decompose present themselves, yet we continue to needlessly use gas leaf blowers. 
Banning leaf blowers is low hanging fruit, but its impacts across Menlo Park are sure to be fruitful. Again, thank you for your time and I hope the honorable council members have a nice night. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker will be Kathleen Daly, followed by Sean McGuire. Hello, hi, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Hi, thank you. I want to first acknowledge the um, council for giving me a few minutes to speak. And I also want to speak in support of every scientist and every person and physician that's come forward in the last few minutes to talk about this issue. I couldn't agree more with all of them. I wake up to the sound of a leaf blower about 5.30 every morning across the um, street from where I live. So I get that it's annoying. I get this the um, risk that they pose to all of us and I couldn't agree more. That said, I am also concerned about the service workers, the, the gardeners, the gardeners um, who every day um, go out and take care of the beautiful lawns around Menlo Park. They, during the pandemic, were out of work for a good portion of time. And I would like to see the city or people come forward and um, institute a program where we ask them to um, bring in the gas leaf blowers and exchange them for electric blowers or rakes or get people to understand that them being able to do a quick job in 20 minutes, a half an hour is income for them. These are our service workers. These are, are the people that help support and keep the beautiful lawns of Menlo Park the way they are. And asking them to spend a significant amount of money to change the technology, I am so sorry. I think you got my message, sorry. I'm gonna leave. Pepper, stop it. Kathleen, does that conclude your public comment? Oh, it looks like Kathleen might have dropped off. So I will go to our next public commenter, Sean McGuire. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Um, honorable council members and everyone else who's on this call, um, I won't try and expand on what I wrote in. And I think that the doctors on this call have really well covered a lot of the um, uh, issues of health and well being. Um, I, I would like to bring this down to a very local level. I live in a part of town where there are a lot of um, um, absent landlords, rentals, and uh, we get the leaf blowers coming around here, uh, actually not even um, working for the, the residents, but working for the managers of these properties. And I would observe that um, in addition to blowing the leaves and more importantly to me, all of the dust um, in the properties, they actually blow it into the streets and uh, create a, a lot of work for other property owners in the area because they blow the dust and it lands on the windowsills, the windows, the cars, everything. So it's work for everybody else. And um, I heard the comment about the electric leaf blowers and I can see that um, as, as being a, an issue with those as well. Uh, if people, if gardeners continue to have the practice of blowing leaves out of their um, uh, area of, of concern and into the street um, and into neighboring properties. Um, the other thing that, that I think is that this really should be pushed to the um, people who are engaging these gardeners to do this. And 
that any enforcement really should take that into consideration. It's not just the gardeners who are causing these problems, it's the people who, who engage them. Um, so that's my two cents worth and uh, appreciate all you can do for us. Oh, I do have one other point. And that is, um, I see the, 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 the uh, gas um, lawn leaf blowers as one part of the problem, but you've also got lawn mowers, gas powered two stroke lawn mowers and other gardening equipment, edging equipment, um, weed whackers that are in the same category. So uh, at some stage they need to be addressed too. Thank you for uh, allowing me to speak. Thank you for your comment. So this will be the final call for public comment on item N1. And our final speaker will be Lisa Williams. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, council members, thank you very much for addressing this uh, issue this evening. And um, as I said, as you know, my name is Lisa Williams and I'm a Menlo Park resident. So just in order to put the pollutants, i.e. the CO2 pollutant emissions and the, um, the, like the ground level ozone pollution on some sort of human scale, I'd just like to give two examples or two analogies that were made in an Electrify Now webinar earlier this year, which is available on YouTube. And the first analogy was related to the pollution. As I said, the ground level ozone and the unhealthy particulate matter being between you know, 2.5 and 10 micrometers in diameter. And uh, the statement was that a typical mow and blow, weekly mow and blow in an American yard using these gas tools is actually equivalent to the pollution emitted from a car revving in the driveway for 10 hours straight. Now the uh, the second the second analogy which they provided was the, the the CO2 emissions. How to you know how can we get our head around the CO2 emissions from you know garden leaf equipment, garden gas leaf equipment? And the analogy was that in, for using the garden gas tools, it's equivalent to the CO2 emissions produced basically by a wheelbarrow full of plastic trash. So, you know, that, that for me made an impression in terms of, you know, dumping that on my front yard. So those were two analogies that I would just like people to sort of come to grips with. And in conclusion, um, I just wanted to also ask the council to please support the Environmental Quality Commission's recommendation to direct the staff to prepare a report on gas leaf blowers <clears throat> in Menlo Park. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. On seeing no further hands raised, Mayor Combs, you may continue. Great, right. uh, thank you, uh, City Clerk Heron, and, and thank you to all the uh, public commenters, especially uh, Mr. Uh, Meyer Asensio. It's always uh, good to hear from um, uh, younger people in, in the community. Um, so bringing it back to the council, let's first, I want to uh, bifurcate the uh, leaf blower issue from everything else on the work plan. And so I say, let's first go around and see if there's any comments or questions in connection with everything on the work plan, um, except for the, uh, the proposed uh, leaf blower ban. Um, and I, I have, a, I'll kick it off with a question, um, I think for, for Miss Lucky. Uh, one of the items was in connection with the urban canopy. Um, now I know um, based on discussions, I think with the city manager and the city attorney that there's going to be needed tweaks to the heritage tree ordinance is, does that come under that urban canopy um, bullet or, or, or go separate and is the EQC um, currently not planning to play any substantive role in any any possible tweaks to the, the uh, heritage tree ordinance. Thank you, Mayor Combs. So the work plan that the EQC has in regards to the urban canopy is, is looking at, um, you know, how is the implementation of the updated um, or reformed heritage tree ordinance 
going and just reviewing and monitoring that. So it's part of the work plan task. They haven't gotten to that um, point in time yet because they've been uh, working on the climate action plan implementation areas as a focus. Um, and so that that's kind of the, the breadth. There might be one other item. I just need to, to look at their work plan, but that's what I know off the top of my head. Okay, Th thanks. Um, any other council uh, questions? Uh, council member Mueller, council member Taylor. Um, I'm, I'm not <laughs> trying to call on you if, if you uh, don't wish to speak, but I can't, I can't see you. So I, I just wanna make sure I don't, I don't miss you. And, 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 um, council member Taylor. Thank you, Mayor Combs. And actually, I, I have a, a question um, regarding the tree canopy um, for Miss Lucky. And that is, is there a, a standard or a certain percentage, um, just thinking about tree canopies, there, since they're not all the same in Menlo Park, um, but if there's a baseline for what percentage of a community um, would need as to have a, um, a fair tree canopy? Yes, thanks, Council Member Taylor. So uh, it's very broad what's in the work plan. So just going back to Mayor Combs' question too. So the other item is to research ways other cities measure health of urban forest and make a recommendation to council. So that's what they have as a specific task in addition to receive an update on the implementation and operation of the heritage tree ordinance and recommend any adjustments as needed. So a follow-up question. So does that mean that a baseline will be established? It's not specific in there, but if the city council, you know, as a, it would like to have a consensus around that, it could be added to the work plan. Do you think that'll be a, a big lift to add it? I think they could incorporate looking at what other cities do. Um, there's, I'm, I haven't researched it myself in great degree but I imagine that there are some examples to pull from and, and look toward. And they, they do have a subcommittee that is focused on heritage trees as well, heritage trees and urban canopy. Okay, and you're treating them as two separate topics or all together? All together. All together, okay, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Taylor. Vice Mayor Nash. So first of all, I want to just commend the EQC for all the work they're doing. They are just amazing in their dedication to the city and the um, environmental quality of the city and um, climate action plan and what they are doing has just been um, fabulous. So thank you to all the commissioners and to all the staff that's been supporting them so um, beautifully. I would, um, regarding the heritage tree um, work plan, I would love to see a urban canopy master plan come from this and um, as part of the work plan. And that's something where I believe that um, it can be outsourced to a consultant and that would actually give us answers to, for example, um, what council member Taylor was interested in, what is the percentage of canopy within various areas of the city and what is, um, then we can actually start measuring whether our heritage tree ordinance is actually maintaining status quo, whether we're decreasing the number of um, the canopy in our city or increasing it. And it seems very important um, at this point to take a look at it. There's um, there are some residents who looked recently at part of the heritage tree um, permits and came up with, this was for development permits, came up with 99% of the permits were approved. And just if I think as part of the review, when it does happen with the EQC, if they could take a look at um, what is happening and also just what is, are we, how are we doing with um, the maintenance of our urban tree canopy? I think would be great. Thank you.
Thank you, uh, Vice Mayor uh, Nash. Um, I, th I think also supportive of, of the idea of getting a, a, you know, some sort of assessment of, of the, the urban canopy, um, yeah, especially the extent to which it can be done with sort of a, a, a consultant. Um, okay, seeing no other um, indication that council wants to comment or, or has questions on, on this part of the work planned, um, I, I think we can move on to the, the, the proposed leaf blower ban. Um, so I, I'll, I'll kick it off. My question for Ms. Lucky is, is the state recently passed legislation banning the sale of, of these types of, 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 of tools um, to take place in 2024? Um, do you, and I didn't follow, I, I know I think it was the author of that or one of the authors was actually a local uh, assembly uh, person, I, I think our, our representative, but I can't say I followed it closely. Do we know why the state didn't enact an actual ban instead of just banning the sale of in, in 2024? Do, do we have any understanding of, of that, that discussion, why the state went, went in that direction? We don't have any indication as to why they pursued the sale over the operation. I mean, you could speculate, you know, California being it's a large state that it is, transitions can occur quicker in some communities and maybe not in others. Um, but that's probably as far as I'd go in, in speculation and in pro potentially providing the time to transition. Um, and the state also is looking to uh, create a program um, like a trade-in program or an incentive program to help retire the gas-powered leaf blowers, but there's no timeline that I'm aware of of when that might be implemented um, going forward. But it is it is uh, appropriated to to do that kind of a program. Yeah, thanks. And then um, my one other other question, then I'll, I'll pass it on to my my colleagues. Um, one public commenter mentioned uh, Menlo Park's prior history um, with this, this issue and, and that a, a ban was approved by the council and then I think overturned uh, by voters. Uh, in, in, as, as part of that, that recitation of, of the history, there was a, a, a talk about the engagement with the Gartner's associations. Um, obviously, the, the, those um, in the community that use uh, these tools or tool the most are, are, are local gardeners. Um, have we engaged um, that community at all, whether it through an formal association or any other um, any other avenues um, to get to get some sense? I, I know obviously that. that that community isn't necessarily represented on the EQC, and, and obviously they are um, uh, key and important stakeholders. And, and so I want to see if, to this point, there, there has been any engagement. No, there there hasn't been any engagement. Okay. Um, uh, uh, others on council, and I'll hold my my, my overall uh, comments. Um, but are there others on council who have, have some questions? Uh, I'm sorry, Vice Mayor Nash. Thank you. Um, I just first want to acknowledge the leadership and hard work of uh, by EQC Commissioner Leah Elkins who on banning the gas powered blowers. As um, was mentioned, she was a subcommittee of one who put all of this together and has really done an exemplary job um, bringing this forward to us, um, especially based on the um, council request to address this issue. Um, and actually, I guess that's all I will say at this point. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll go back to you first though when it comes to, because I know that I, do, I don't want to artificially cut, cut you off, but um, council member Mueller or, or, or council member Taylor just want to sort of do a double check of whether you guys have any, any uh, questions from uh, for, for staff on on the uh, the, the proposed uh, uh, leaf blower ban. Uh, uh, Council Member Taylor. Thank you, Mayor Combs. Um, I just wanted to follow up. There was a comment regarding a buyback program. Um, just wanted to find out if that was 
something um, Ms. Lucky could follow up on. Thank you. Thanks, Councilmember Taylor. So um, right now, the way that EQC's recommendation stands, it doesn't necessarily advise on that. Doesn't mean that they wouldn't um, if they were asked. Uh, I, from the peripheral of what I know of other, the most recent city, Portola Valley, that's um, instituted a leaf blower ban, they did seem to have a complementary program where there was a trade-in uh, program for a limited amount of time. Um, and that was um, a program that was administered by the city. So I know that's a, an additional option that could be explored. Um, and as I mentioned, the state program is looking to create a, an incentive program because they're looking to implement the ban, not the, the ban on the sale by 2024. So the program I would imagine needs to come before that so that it gives landscapers enough time to transition. I just have one follow up. Um, just thinking about the time between um, our our ordinance going into effect and then the states. I'm thinking about the the interim, um, and then of course encouraging folks to use. Um, well, they won't have a choice but to use an electric leaf blower. And so, what can we do in the interim, and would it need to be included in this ordinance? Yeah. So. I'm uh, just a so the, the, the state legislation or the rule that's going into place is, is going to ban the sale. So there's going to be a time period where gas powered leaf blowers will be able to operate. So it's really individual communities that are banning that operation component, um, whereas the state's going after that sale. So as far as the interim things that we could do, I mean, that's something um, that staff could. Um, bring back to city council in early 2022 and go over the timeline, the available resources and a potential different approaches um, to, to move through as, as part of the consideration in developing an ordinance. So I don't have any particular answers, but it's definitely something we can come back and, and provide more clarity or options for the city council to consider. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Taylor. Council Member Mueller. Yeah, I, uh, Mayor Combs, I believe you asked the question and I'm sorry, but I didn't, wasn't quite sure I heard the answer. And that was the Gardeners Association has or has not been even spoken to? H has not, uh, not from, as my understanding, anyone um, on, on city staff or, or any EQC commissioners. There was a public commenter who said that uh, one of the Gardeners associations that some years ago opposed the ban is, is now supportive of it. Um, but, but that's, that's the only um, sort of, uh, you know, really have information about, about where, where, um, where gar any Gardeners associations stand on this. So I just will cut to the quick of where I am on this is I actually, I'm, I'm supportive of the ban but I also believe we need to have a process that actually reaches out to the stakeholders affected by it. I'd like to see the item come back for final approval, but I would like a, I would like a program similar to what Portal, Portola Valley put together with, with respect to a specific amount of time that the city would be in some way uh, either <laughs> buying back or contributing to the purchase of the replacement, uh, replacement, uh, blowers so if we could get some more if we could have a recommendation from staff based on what those other cities have done but i you know i was actually coming tonight prepared to approve it but if you know if a key stakeholder isn't hasn't been officially reached out to yet i think process demands that we do that so uh thank you <laughs> Uh, thank you, Councilmember Mueller. Uh, Vice Mayor Nash, I, I said I would. <laughs> Councilmember Mueller jumped the gun <laughs> uh, and didn't follow my directions. <laughs> but I'm, I'm going <laughs> to. You can go now. Well, I am um, believe that the city um, should implement a ban that we need to get in sync with our other um, 
adjacent cities and that it actually will be much easier for gardeners to have um, a uniform um, a uniformity where everyone all the cities are saying electric blowers we've heard very you know there's so much evidence out there that um, it is a health hazard a noise hazard which is also a health hazard and I think that it's um, past time that we do implement an ordinance having said that I would like to um, see if we could shortcut things a little bit by seeing if um, perhaps our city attorney's office um, is aware of ordinances or could come up with some sort of ordinance based on other um, local cities. And we were talking earlier tonight, I believe Atherton has an ordinance that has been um, used as a prototype for other cities. So basically, if we can come up, if we can shortcut some of the um, work that other staff has to do and um, use that as a prototype, that would be great. Um, I do think um, that it's far overdue and that what the city, what the state is um, putting in place is good, but it's um, several years off and won't actually ban the use of it. It'll just ban the sale of it. Um, having said that, I think to me, the easy part is putting in an ordinance. The hard part is what to do about enforcement. And I would recommend that we get an ordinance in um, soon and that we put the enforcement off for maybe a year while we focus on doing some education and perhaps the um, EQC can help with that. I know that um, Ms. Elkins, uh, Commissioner Elkins um, has done a lot of research and also has a group of grassroots, um, sort of a grassroots organization around her of other folks and perhaps um, they can come up with some sort of recommendations for an education program or something to again, um, at this point while we are short staffed um, help leverage our staff um, in that way. And also they're very knowledgeable at this point. So to me, it's um, yes, do an ordinance quickly, um, but don't immediately start enforcement of um, the ordinance. And then just so many um, people are concerned about gas powered leaf blowers. And I would just encourage all homeowners and people who are currently have gardeners who are using gas powered leaf blowers, you have the ability to certainly talk to your um, and encourage your gardeners to make that change. And um, one thing that the city can do certainly is the ordinance and um, something with enforcement, but truly the um, biggest impact probably will come from those individuals who are the homeowners, the um, residents who are actually employing the gardeners and Enc if, please encourage them to go with the electric um, powered equipment and perhaps even preferably the rake and broom. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor Nash. I'll, um, you know, sort of add uh, my comments to the discussion and then I'll, I'll, I'll see if there's uh, some uh, direction on this, this issue we can coalesce around. I do want to first acknowledge since you I called out Miss Elkins that uh, Miss Williams has also <laughs> been a key figure um, in, in this effort and, and um, uh, for, for, for some, some, some years now. Um, but I do think you, you touch on, uh, Vice Mayor Nash, my concern. So I, I can be supportive of, um, of a ban or prohibition. I was thinking more of a delayed, um, um, uh, uh, a delayed enactment uh, of the ordinance, um, but I could also come around to this um, ordinance, you, you know, uh, coming uh, coming online more quickly, but an enforcement being delayed. But then that that does get to my issue or my concern about uh, enforcement. While a number of cities have um, actually enacted bans, it's not clear to me like how many have really effective enforcement strategies and. Um, for instance, you know, Palo Alto, like, right? I can't tell you how many threads I've seen on different sort of uh, platforms or comments in Palo Alto about the lack of enforcement. And so, and I do think this, you, you know, becomes uh, 
an issue where then people are frustrated because then they think that this thing exists out there. And, and, I, and we see it in Menlo Park with, with the, um, we're seeing a lot with the um, off-leash dog activity, <laughs> like, right, wh whether, and, and right now there are lots of people in the community incredibly frustrated because there is a sense that this is something that is not allowed and that there should be clear sort of ramifications for doing it. And how the city can enforce that is somewhat murky. Um, and so my concern is introducing just another um, item in the community where there is this sense that, oh, this is something that shouldn't be happening and it's wrong and the city says you can't do it, but then we don't really have an effective enforcement mechanism or the, the enforcement uh, resources. Um, and so th that's like my concern. Um, and while, you know, it'd be easy to say, okay, let's, let's, you know, get the ordinance out there. But again, my concern is that we'll, we'll have lots of, lots of, uh, frustrated, um, residents, um, uh, because they'll, they'll have a leaf floor and then they'll, they'll have read an almanac that this was banned and, and then they'll, they'll call the police. The police will say, call code enforcement, code enforcement will say, um, we are bandwidth constrained, and then and then they will email us. <laughs> and that's not. I, I like getting residents email, and, and certainly good and bad. I, I I welcome it. I volunteered for this, but then I'm not able to provide much of a relief um, in these these situations either, as as with the the off leash dog activity. And so that's for me um, the the issue. But and I, I wanted to put that out there to give some sense of where I'm coming at. But but let's. Um, I also want to give a, a council member Taylor a, a, a chance to sort of generally chime in with her thoughts and then let's see um, if there is a consensus on on sort of the direction or, or if not a consensus just where where the majority is at as far as as, as direction on, on on next steps for the site. Thank you, Mayor Combs. And I am supportive of the band, but I, I share um, concerns of, of everything that's been stated, um, especially around enforcement. I know that um, it is important for something like this to definitely um, do outreach, especially with the key stakeholders. Um, I'm concerned that if we don't do something, six months will pass by um, and we haven't um, at least um, begun the process. So I'm not sure what it would look like, and I'm not sure if Miss Miss Lucky um, could follow up on this. But what it would look like if we did, as Vice Mayor Nash um, suggested, um, at least started the process, but didn't do enforcement, would that be more chaotic than going full forward, going 100% forward, or if we phase things in, um, what would make most sense? considering our staff resources. Thank you, Council Member Taylor. Um, so I, I think there's different ways of approaching it and, and to try to maybe come in the middle here between the concerns and, and kind of getting something underway is, you know, we could, start to do the outreach um, to figure out kind of what resources we have to, to and skill sets that we have available to do the outreach and then study the enforcement um, approaches to that because um, there are lots of questions about you know, who would receive the penalty um, and just as Mayor Combs mentioned the capacity as well so I think there, there's enough for us to begin to engage with stakeholders and come back to city council um, with a potential timeline and, and, and the engagement of the um, major stakeholders like the Gardeners Association uh, and then kind of provide that timeline and, and resources that are needed uh, or available in early 2022. I'm looking at January, February. Thank you, Ms. Lucky. Um, I, I would be supportive of that of that direction, um, um, but um, as you as, as you you outlined it, doing some outreach to stakeholders and and coming back with um, 
some sort of draft workment uh, with also a component of ex exactly how enforcement would look and what those resources would entail um, early next year. Is is that? Uh, but but let's go around and see uh, if and and please correct me if that is not an accurate uh, synopsis of what what you laid out. Um, and also want to get some thoughts from from the rest of council on on, on what what you laid out as the next steps. Yeah, thanks, Mayor Combs. So, I, uh, yeah, I think yes, that's along the lines of what I was um, kind of going towards. We could um, probably it might be again if the council wants to consider, we could do the outreach, come back as more of a, um, a study session on how would we approach enforcement, so that way it can inform how to draft the ordinance itself. Okay. Yeah. That 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 actually sounds. <laughs> So, um, Sorry if I wasn't clear. No, 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 no. Um, it was probably all of my interpretation. But yeah, that that, that sort of sounds like certainly make, makes more sense getting some council feedback um, uh, on how enforcement should look before before actually sort of going through the exercise of, of drafting an ordinance. Um, but but let, let's uh, hear where the, the council is on this. Vice Mayor Nash. So once again, I would like to see an, an ordinance more quickly. I do agree that we should reach out to the Gardeners Association. Um, hopefully that would not be a long process. Um, but I think that um, getting an ordinance out there and um, having putting off at least a year for enforcement um, would make sense and base the ordinance on existing or uh, local ordinances around and basically trying to do this in um, as simple a way as possible as opposed to I'm just I'm concerned that if we do um, try to do a lot of outreach um, my experience from um, what we've done on the cap is that that gets um, it's difficult it's it's labor intensive and it's difficult and so i just wonder if um since we're not leading on this on this effort um this there are many cities that have done this and as opposed to um some of the other areas where we're um that we're looking at this is um something where we're following many other cities i and i do not i have yet to hear of um enforcement that really works and is um, good. But I think that what I think we have heard loud and clear is that we do, people do want an ordinance. Um, and it is, I, I just believe that we should get something in there and do some education and um, make it clear that we are delaying enforcement um, for, a year. And also that will give time to get more information about what's going on with, at the state level and um, at what point they're going to do some incentives um, for the gardeners. And um, hopefully that might um, be of benefit to the city as well. So I'm going to turn to the, the city attorney because as, as I'm thinking about this, like would not it be more appropriate to just sort of delay enactment of the ordinance versus actually having an ordinance go into effect of which there's clear council discussion that there's going to be no enforcement of of the ordinance for a specific period of time? I mean, like how have communities approached that? That, that would sort of make me uncomfortable it, it sort of reminds me of i think a, a resident once reached out to me because she sort of was i don't know what you call that like curtain parking where you park like sort of across the the sidewalk of your driveway and she had gotten a ticket and she had said and she she emailed me and complained and she's like well years ago the e sent me an email saying that like i wouldn't get a ticket from that for that and i was like well why should you just get the email that says you shouldn't get a ticket for that if, if it's if it's if it's if it's uh, prohibited, and so my question is 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 that like if we have an ordinance and some people know that there's no enforcement, um, but then some people don't know, wouldn't it be better just to delay 
enactment of the ordinance and when it does go into effect, um, it is fully in effect. And so, but I wanna sort of, maybe it is the case that lots of people do, lots of cities do all the time enact an ordinance uh, that in theory are fully in effect but aren't enforced for, for some period of time. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I think maybe this discussion will be assisted by talking about our enforcement options. There aren't that many, they're not complicated. And so I don't think that we need to like revisit at length our options, but we do need to discuss the resources necessary for them. So the way that we would enforce this issue and that this um, ordinance is through issuance of administrative citations. And then there's various like follow up for non-payment of administrative citations and there's various appeal options. And that's like pretty much it. We likely would not make it um, a misdemeanor that would um, subject someone to arrest. It wouldn't be a criminal penalty. It would just be a civil penalty subject to citation in varying degrees as the violations continue. Um, the resources that go into that are um, code enforcement staffing to identify that the violations have occurred. Um, Code enforcement staffing to assist in issuance of the administrative citations. We usually outsource that. We already have a vendor on contract with the city, but it does require code enforcement staff to send the actual citations and facts and background to the vendor that issues our citations. And then the city typically hires the appeals and we do have to have an appeal process which allows people to appeal the issuance of the citation and also then provides for financial hardship waivers. And all those things do of course take some time. Um, and we have really limited code enforcement staff. I'm looking at Starla, she'll know better um, than I about that, but. So if I can tell me, who yeah. are we citing? Are we citing the actual person with the leaf blower and does it have to be like, at the moment, would it on? Um, or are we citing a property owner, which to me becomes a lot more complex <laughs> because there's a sense of like, you know, I could say I didn't, I didn't know and he or she had said that they were using a, a, you know, an electric leaf floor. And so I, I think to me, it's less like that, that process, which as you said, makes perfect sense, but who, who gets the citation? Yeah, that's a good question. So typically we just, um cite the violator themselves. There are examples of other cities and other contexts where the owner of the property upon which the violation occurs can be subject to citations. That can, as you said, is trickier. I've seen it in other contexts, like with short-term rental permits and things like that. With a leaf flow or violation um, or ban, we would probably just cite the violator themselves at the time of violation. Um, and it, so it would require code enforcement to actually come out, see the violation or have enough facts and circumstances to um, confirm that a violation had occurred and then either issue a citation in person or to the business or residence of the person who had done the violation. Yeah, I would so, sort of guess that this would probably require at least one full extra code enforcement officer just to respond to, to especially as, as it's being rolled out. And so, um, I, I mean, that's just my back of the envelope <laughs> sort of, um, but I can imagine that, that this would be a situation where you would, you would get lots of, lots of calls and there would be lots of sort of, um, you know, processing of, of, of citations. But I, I'll, I'll let the city manager chime in. Well, we do have some experience with this from when we banned um, gardening services during the early days of the pandemic. And I think that there's also the expectation that there's on-demand code enforcement. Like people are waiting to go out and catch the person who's only gonna be there for 45 minutes to an hour and 15 minutes. So I think that, that those conditions really hamper uh, successful enforcement where where the it i mean it just brings up a lot of social issues right mm -hmm. that we're enforcing against the gardener that the homeowner may or may not be aware of the tools that the gardener is using and and the expectation from the community that we are on demand which is not true thank you um so where does you um, 
Vice Mayor Mann, I'll go back to you because you seem to, um, Miss Lucky sketched out sort of next steps. And you seem to indicate that that was, and, and as it coming, reaching out to stakeholders and coming back with sort of a study session on this item early next year, you seem to indicate that that timeline was maybe a little too long for you. So what, and don't let me put words in, in your mouth, but so what sort of, like what sort of timeline and what would you see then as that, that the, the next time the council sees this, how would you want it to look or how, how what would that agenda item look like? So I think in, I would love to see it the way we have been discussing it, where it is a more prolonged, more staff intensive um, work. I just am concerned about um, the amount of staff time that it will take and the amount of, and what doesn't get done. And so that is my big concern. I think that, you know, yes, I would love to have more outreach, um, a study session, all of that. I'm just concerned that, um, and also um, between staff time and um, our council agenda time, that it's it will prolong this. Um, I guess I would be interested in hearing what Ms. Elkins, who I believe is on the line, um, if that would be appropriate, um, just any input from her. If that's it's, permissible, it's fine with me to promote her to uh, um, if, if she wants to to comment. I think you can uh, uh, chime in with your comments, Ms. Elkins, uh, whenever you're ready. Uh, you're you're muted. I don't know if you're talking or I don't know if the mute is on your end or on our end. Oh, okay. I'm here and I am speaking. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, I could just um, start talking about this or is there a specific question that um, Council would like me to address. So, um, uh, given that this has been a topic, obviously that, that you've um, advocated for, for 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 some time, and it seems like there is a general consensus to move forward um, by the council. Obviously, there there is some. Um, we're, we're not in alignment on on what next steps look like, and so what what next steps look like. Uh, from your perspective as someone who is who has advocated uh, for for this ban for some time right okay so um, my feeling is sort of in line with um, uh, vice mayor Nash's that um, it's best to start as soon as possible um, so that to get the word out that that a ban is imminent and so that doesn't mean that there has to be a, a ban enacted at um, you know, technically until the date that you want it to be enacted, but that um, it should be a done deal that there will be a ban and so that then education and outreach can be based on the fact of, that there's a ban as of a certain date. In my mind, it would be the, um, the most neat way to do it would be to have the ban effective January 1st, 2024, when the sales of gas powered um, lawn equipment will also be banned. And so um, going backwards from that date, it would make sense to start as of January 1st, 2023 um, with an education campaign where we say to people, uh, employers of gardeners, gardeners themselves, um, a ban is imminent. You may know that the sales are also gonna be banned as of this date. and. Um, also, um, Menlo, in Menlo Park, we will be banning the use of gas-powered leaf blowers, and you know this is 
your your chance to switch to electric um, before that ban takes place. Um, and, and so that would be my um, vision of how it would go. Um, so it would kind of be front loaded with the with the education and the outreach, maybe having a, a flyer or a door hanger um, that volunteers could hand out. I don't know what the um, logistics or the um, appropriateness of that would be, but um, certainly um, it's true that it is hard to uh, inform the entire uh, public of anything in particular, but next door has uh, clearly been a great way to to communicate with the populace. Um, and I think something like door hangers um, or um, postings at the library, um, and you could have, if you if it would, was appropriate, having a, a citizen task force that would sort of not patrol, I don't wanna say that, but um, would hand out informational flyers to people to, to um, gardeners and to um, homeowners as they witness the use of gas powered leaf blowers doing it in a friendly and a, you know kind way of just informing people that this was coming and um, and then I would say um, as of the date that was chosen to be the um, the date of enactment then, enforcement could begin. And um, again, I think that that enforcement should be um, tilted towards more of an education approach that um, these blowers are now banned in this city and this is your, your warning. And, but if you, know, you are caught again using the blower now that we have, have uh, information that you, you know, we have knowledge that you've been told, um, then there will be an administrative citation with this, with a, a not, you know, with a, a, a mediocre fine. I wouldn't want any large amounts of money to be involved, but just enough to, for it to be something that people don't just trash, throw in the trash can. And then eventually um, with the ban, uh, with the ban on sales being in place, um, with the with neighboring communities also banning leaf blowers um, and with just the changing uh, perceptions around these, um, these machines, given the, the climate crisis, but also the pandemic and people being at home and you know all the reasons why this has come up in front of the council so often recently. I think it, if we don't look at it as a, um, something that we're gonna try and stop on day one, but we're looking at it as a process, then that would be a way to be successful. Right. Um, th thank you, uh, Ms. Elkins, for those th those comments. I also actually want to sort of, uh, before we move on, uh, go back to public comments and um, and express my gratitude and thank those uh, medical experts in our community for uh, um, providing um, comment based on their 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 medical expertise. Um, medical and scientific expertise. Sadly, we've seen um, in our country recently um, medical and scientific expertise uh, discarded by uh, political figures. And I wanna make it clear that that certainly is not the, the Menlo Park City Council. <laughs> um, and, and your comments were, 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 were welcomed um, and uh, um, were, were, were certainly welcomed and, and, and appreciated. I would go back based on some the, the sort of the timeline that Ms. Elkins sort of sketched out. I don't know that that is contrary to what Ms. Lucky sort of sort of sketched out as is we see this next based on so, sort of a, a little bit more analysis on how the enforcement would look and the resources oh. and and also um, with some sort of outreach to to stakeholders. Um, that it does concern me again, like I said, we, we are t t talking about. Um, uh, I, I think something that that is a, is a is a health hazard. We can all agree, but it is something that is a, a key part of people's livelihood. Um, it's not it's not sort of recreation, right. and so, um, I, I do want to to 
to, to make sure that 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 is um, that that outreach does does take that does occur like right and 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 that's in some degree the government process it is kind of slower than many instances right. deliberative but uh, but again when you have again the, the city essentially enacting law that says that you, you know you can't use something that you use to do your job even the extent to which alternatives exist. Um, I, I do think that that's a scenario that that requires that we um, we've we've done done um, y you know some not insignificant um, uh, amount of outreach. Could I just address that for um, sure regarding um, the 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 fact that there was no outreach to um, those particular stakeholders? Um, as noted, I I did write this report. And um, I did research that issue. And really, the reason was that there was no outreach was because I couldn't really find anybody to, out, to reach out to other than to just go out into the street and talk to individual gardeners. This Bay Area um, Gardeners Association is a, a, a telephone number in Redwood City, but otherwise has no presence. Um, um, I did call the, the telephone number, but um, I'm, trying, I'm having trouble remembering what happened, but I didn't um, receive a response back. Um, so I certainly am not against that. And I think it's a great idea. It just um, would need some assistance in figuring out um, how to do that. Yeah, totally fair. And thank you for providing that that, that, that background. And again, not, not surprising, obviously, that, that you, uh, you attempted to do that outreach. Council Member Mueller. Yeah, I want to uh, thank uh, Ms. Elkins for her work on this. And the Bay Area Gardeners Association is indeed an organization. They have an award ceremony that they and where they actually award, honor individuals in the community. I don't know if they've done it since COVID started, but they did it for many years in a row, years past. So, I mean, I'm, I mean, basically, I mean, Mayor Combs, I mean, you, I had it written down and you just said it. Uh, so I'm going to be somewhat repeating it, but so uh, to be clear, like I, I strongly lean toward the ban this evening. I was uh, ready to to let's you know let's let's move things along. But the thing that the difficulty is without the key, the key stakeholder and Miss Milcom Miss to be clear, like I don't even it's not even a question to, to me whether or not you should have engaged them before this meeting. It's just they're not here tonight. They haven't been invited here tonight and in government there's fair hearing and due process and the fact that we're talking about impacting people's livelihoods without them invited to the discussion even with our best effort uh, or with efforts we just need to get them here for that to take place so um, at least that's where i am at on it i just don't want to impact someone's livelihood without without them being here so I'm I am where we or I was at the start. Uh, I would have appreciated a timeline that brought brought back that where we had a hearing with uh, or uh, at least a meeting with those stakeholders present uh, and invited, and then we could go ahead and make a decision then on what we're doing with respect to the ordinance, but I would not want to adopt an ordinance without them being present uh, for those for those due process concerns. And then I would want, uh, and then I do very much want as part of that process when it's brought back to us to know about how other cities have approached uh, either a, a buyback or contribution plan. It can be one done at need uh, certainly we can look at need being a factor, but I think that's that's entirely appropriate because there are different levels of gardener service throughout the city. And uh, this, I would not want to have a disproportionate impact uh, on, on, one, on uh, one level of gardener versus another. So thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Council Member M Mueller. I think I'm gonna go um, to uh, Vice Mayor 
and Nash, but I, I don't, I think um, there, or maybe I won't go to Vice Mayor. Okay. Well, what I was going to say is it, there doesn't seem to be at least three votes for something more, uh, an, an approach sort of, for lack of a better word, more aggressive than what Miss Lucky lined out. And so in that sense, I, I think we default to, to, to that. Since, since I don't see that, that, that there is, uh, again, strong support among a majority of the council for something um, more, more accelerated. And, and so then it seems as though uh, what we would coalesce around is, is that uh, we would see this again as a study session and that, that there had, would have been some, uh, some outreach to, um, to, uh, to uh, impact its stakeholders um, uh, when we see this next and th that we would have um, some sort of, you know, sort of sketched out schemes as far as, as like how the enforcement would look and what is city resources would be entailed in, in, um, in, um, in enforcing, in enforcing. Um, but, um, but yes, so I think, I think that that's, that's where we're at on this, unless I, I hear objections otherwise. Um, okay. So, so then on the, the, uh, Council Member Taylor. Thank you, Mayor Combs. I, I just I wanted to um, to follow up. Um, I, I I know the majority of the council is in support of a moving moving forward all based on this timeline. Um, I I am in support of moving forward. My concern is just around um, one around lake language, um, making sure that information is going out in both English and Spanish, um, and not just a post. Um, but printed material. Um, but the other piece is allowing time for there to be for all these other things that are happening. There's just a lot of things happening. And, and I have kind of like a, a comment and I wanted to make about the subcommittee that from the council that is a part of the EQC and the CAP. And it would be really helpful to have a timeline of all the items with a dollar amount attached to it. Um, I think it would be extremely helpful. Um, just thinking about the last item that came, the $1.9 billion for the, the cars, um, it would be nice to know that these items are coming and what dollar amounts they are, that are attached to them as opposed to them just being on a council agenda. Just a heads up for the timeline on the cap, one through six. Okay, thank you. Uh, th thank you, uh, Council Member Taylor, and, and uh, definitely really, really fair points. Um, okay, so, so on that, I'll, 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 I'll see if there is a, a motion, um, right, to so, sort of approve the annual work plan, and, and with regards to the, um, the, the gas uh, part leaf blower. Uh, Proposal that, that that the next step would be as as it was sketched out by by Miss Lucky, um, with with a study session um, um, as as the next step, um, and so is that is that where we are? I, I can make that motion <laughs> that uh, if if someone wants to add something ad additional, I, I think that there were. Um, Regarding some of the the other elements, were there any ad additional sort of comments or qualifications that, that I'm missing? Uh, Vice Mayor Nash. Thank you. So I just had one request, and that's um, with the comment that Council Member Taylor made um, that we look at the um, total cost, but also at net costs, because um, I think that's something that really got buried within um, the last item is money was going to be spent. It's what is the incremental amount to accomplish some of these goals? Thank you. Yeah. And in that case, you're talking about sort of real dollars, not like sort of uh, an estimate of what the positive impact would be, but just this idea that we were going to spend some amount of dollars anyway. Um, and, and, and uh, okay, T totally, t totally fair for that point. Um, okay. So, so, so I've I've made a motion. Is with does that before I go for a second, uh, City Clerk Karen, does that motion work for you, or, or is what, it? Uh, <laughs> you want me to restate it for the record? And make sure I <laughs> okay. incorporated everything. Uh, 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 City Attorney Doherty. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, the motion would be to. Um, I can restate what I have. Oh, does that okay. work? Sure. Okay. And then yes, if Council has further 
additions or redactions, let me know. It is one, to receive the annual report from the EQC, two, approve the commission's annual work plan, and three, direct staff to engage with all stakeholders, then return to city council as a study session with how enforcement, implementation, staff resources, and total and net costs regarding an ordinance banning gas powered leaf blowers. Yeah, that, that's fine. Although I think the, the cost was more in connection with um, some of the other elements of, of, of the cap. Uh, specifically, I think like the cars are like great. Um, so I, I don't- Okay, so I can add that to the minutes and not in the motion. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Totally fine. And does um, Vice Mayor Nash? I just wanted to know whether um, city manager Jerome Robinson wants to make any comments about this as far as staffing. I think those comments are best held to the study session. Council Member Taylor. Thank you, Mayor Combs. I just um, just wanted to clarify on the timeline. Is this item coming back to us before our goal setting? I'll defer to the city manager. <laughs> uh, uh, that depends. So I, I don't have a yes or no answer on that, but. Uh, more, it's a really good point, Council Member Taylor. We'll, uh, we'll take that into consideration as we plan the January and February agendas. Thank you. Okay, so we, we have a motion as um, uh, uh, as made by me and, and clarified by the city clerk. Uh, is, is there is there a, a second? I'll second it. Thank you, City Council Member Mueller. So I have a motion by Mayor Combs and a second by City Council Member Mueller to one, receive the annual report from the EQC, approve the EQC's annual work plan, and direct staff to engage all stakeholders and return to the City Council as a study session with enforcement, implementation, and staff resources regarding an ordinance banning gas powered leaf blowers. Any further City Council question or discussion? Seeing none by roll call vote, City Council Member Mueller? Yes. City Council Member Taylor? Yes. Vice Mayor Nash? Yes. Mayor Combs? Yes. And the motion passes with City Council Member Willison absent. Thank you. Great. Thank you, City Clerk Heron. Um, now we will move on to the second item in our regular business introduction of first reading of ordinance number 1080, amending ordinance number. 1074, modifying the city council's regular meeting schedule. Uh, here to introduce the item is, is city clerk, Judy Heron. Thank you, Mayor Combs, members of the city council. At the November 9th city council meeting, the city council approved a resolution amending the regular meetings for the remainder of calendar year 2021 for regular meetings to begin at 6 p.m. opposed to 5 p.m. At that meeting, the city council also requested staff to return an ordinance amending the municipal code, modifying the city council's regular meeting schedule from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, the request this evening is to waive the first reading and introduce ordinance number 1080, amending that ordinance 1074. That concludes my introduction. Happy to take public comment. Yeah, let's, let's call for public comment. Thank you, Mayor Combs. At this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak, on item N2, introduction and first reading of ordinance number 1080, amending ordinance number 1074, modifying the city council's regular meeting schedule. Please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you are calling in from a landline, please press star nine now. So this will be the final call for public comment on item N2. Seeing no hands raised, Mayor Combs, you may continue. All right, thank you, City Clerk Karen. Um, are, are there any comments or questions uh, from the, the council on this item? Uh, Vice Mayor Nash. So I move um, that we proceed with the ordinance. I'll second. Thank you. So I have a motion on the floor by Vice Mayor Nash, a second by Mayor Combs. 
to waive the first reading and introduce ordinance number 1080, amending ordinance number 1074, modifying the city council's regular meeting schedule. Any further city council question or discussion? Seeing none, by roll call vote, city council member Mueller? Yes. City council member Taylor? Yes. Mayor Nash? Yes. Mayor Combs? Yes. And the motion passes with city council member Willison absent. Thank you. Great, thank you city clerk Karen. Uh, moving on to the third item on our regular uh, business. Um, adopt resolution number 6686, approving the 2021 San Mateo multi San Mateo County multi-jurisdictional local hazard mitigation plan. Um, here to introduce the item is Public Works Director, Director Nikki Nagaya. Good evening again, Mayor Combs. Vice Mayor Nash, Council Members, um, Nikki Nagaya, Public Works Director for the City, and happy to be here to introduce the item before you tonight, the adoption of the Multi-Jurisdictional Local Hazard Mitigation Plan. Recognize that's a mouthful, so we've abbreviated it for short at LHMP. You may see that uh, throughout the, the presentation tonight. So I will get the slideshow up, and I am Happy to be joined tonight uh, by Joanna Chen, Management Analyst in the Public Works Department, and Brian Henry, the Assistant Director for Maintenance uh, in Public Works as well. I will get, get us started tonight. So I think you can see that. Um, give me one second here. Should be up in just a second. So first, I just would like to highlight um, what we think is the importance and the significance of, of the plan. Uh, the local hazard mitigation plan kind of on paper kind of has the appearance of a routine exercise, uh, but the updates every five years really give us a chance as a comprehensive assessment of the local hazards, uh, both natural and human caused. And in this update cycle, uh, much of the additional focus has been on really the connection to climate change and resiliency planning. So you'll hear some of that throughout the presentation tonight. Uh, and this plan also uh, helps us identify the connections across multiple other city plans and work streams and develops an action plan uh, to reduce the impacts from the hazards that are identified within the, the LHMP. Builds on the cap uh, on the general plan, many other documents that we have uh, kind of guiding policy throughout the city and particularly related to the re resiliency um, staff are also assessing resource levels, as you heard Ms. Lucky in the, the last item mention uh, related to uh, potentially adding support and, and expertise in this area and expect that to be before you at the next council meeting as well. So there's a, a connection to local hazard planning uh, in, in that resiliency work as well. Secondly, I just wanna take a, a, a moment to explain kind of the multi-jurisdictional nature of, of this work that was led by San Mateo County's Department of Emergency Management. All 20 cities in the county participated in the development of the plan, as well as 15 different special districts from around the county. So in total, 36 different partnering agencies uh, participated of particular interest uh, within Menlo Park. In addition to the city, of partners with um, Menlo Park Fire Protection District, uh, One Shoreline, San Mateo County Community College District, and the County Office of Education were all uh, agencies that participated in developing local annex plans as, as part of this work as well. And in addition to uh, San Mateo County as a whole, uh, they had multiple departments within the county um, participating, so the Department of Emergency Management, their public works, uh, staff, Office of Sustainability, planning and building representatives, um, a host of, of other kind of technical experts uh, brought in to identify and mitigate the hazards that are identified. And similarly then within the, the city's work, uh, we've had a very multi-departmental multi team uh, who have contributed to um, broaden the actions that are identified as, as strategies in the plan for implementation. Uh, and then these folks will also, uh, their knowledge will help us better implement the plan uh, going forward. 
uh, as well. So in particular, as I mentioned, I want to acknowledge Joanna uh, and Brian who are uh, with me tonight and will be presenting to you. And with that, I will turn over to Joanna to kick off the rest of the presentation. Uh, thanks, Nikki, for the introduction. Um, so a multi-jurisdiction local hazard mitigation plan, uh, it identifies strategies that would reduce risk or eliminate long-term risk to life and property from a hazard event. It also describes a systematic process of learning about the hazards that could affect the community, setting clear goals, identify, identifying appropriate actions, and following through with an effective mitigation strategy. Lastly, the plan outlines various strategies to reduce vulnerability and exposure to future events. On the next slide, uh, the goals of the multi-jurisdiction LHMP are, but not limited to, protect health and safety, promote hazard mitigation, integrate climate change strategies to increase resiliency, and improve community emergency management capability. Next slide, please. Uh, the multi-jurisdictional LHMP is considered as a living document and would be updated comprehensively every five years with minor revisions made through annual updates. The adoption allows the city to be eligible for FEMA and Cal OES grants. For example, within the past two years, Mama Parks would be awarded for two FEMA grants. Uh, with one hazard mitigation grant underway and one brick grant pending approval, totaling uh, $55 million. The multi-jurisdictional LHMP is a two-volume FEMA plan. Uh, volume one provides an overview of the planning process, risk assessment, goals and objectives, countywide actions, and plan ma uh, maintenance strategy. And lastly, the Volume two, which is also known as an NX plan, provides background information on each jurisdictional specific mitigation action plan. Uh, so now I'll pass it over to the Assistant Public Works Director, Mr. Brian Henry, to talk more about the Mellow Park Annex plan. Great, thank you, Joanna. So there are three phases to every jurisdiction's annex, and the phases can be viewed as chapters that focus on different components of the annex. So phase one, we worked on from February 19th through March 19th of 2021. And it identifies the city team that worked on the annex and our city's profile. So it included our location, our geographical features, the city's history, the governing body format, and the population and development trends. Finally, phase one includes a review of the previous 2016 LHMP. Phase number two, we worked on from April 2nd through May 21st. It provides a capability assessment and integration review, both existing integration and opportunities for future integration with existing plans. The plans are identified on page 47 of attachment C but they include the general plan, the climate action plan, the zoning code, the capital improvement plan, and the urban water management plan, just to name a few. Third, phase three, we worked on from June 11th to July 23rd. Phase three was a risk assessment and development of an action plan, including public outreach and engagement. Next slide, please. This project timeline shows the outreach and engagement throughout the entire process. It included two public surveys, three public workshops, including a workshop in June hosted by Climate Resilient Communities. A full list of outreach activities is included on page five of the staff report. Next slide, please. So now we'll take a closer look at our annex plan. The plan includes 15 maps, and this is an example of one, the FEMA flood hazard area. The yellow line shows the city boundary. The highways are shown in red. The light blue shading is the 100 year flood or a 1% annual chance. And the dark blue shows the 500 year flood 
or a 0.2% annual chance of the flood. Along with 13 other jurisdictions, we applied the equity screening tool to our annex plan which meant including FEMA's Social Vulnerability Index to help rate the hazard risk levels within our city. We developed 34 action items with a focus to mitigate flood, earthquake, and sea level rise and climate change. Next slide, please. This is just an example of four of our 34 action items. These are four projects currently underway. An update to the Chrysler pump station to improve flood protection in the Bayfront area. An update to the city's stormwater master plan to identify areas vulnerable to localized flooding and identify capital projects to mitigate those areas. Implement the city's 2030 climate action plan goals and present strategies to achieve those goals. And fourth, implement the water system master plan to meet the fire flow demand and provide alternative emergency water supply. Next slide, please. So our recommended actions and next steps. First is to adopt resolution number 6686, approving the 2021 San Mateo County Multi-Jurisdictional LHMP. One Shoreline's Board of Directors adopted theirs yesterday. The San Mateo County Board of Supervisors adopted theirs this morning. And right now the City of East Palo Alto and the Menlo Park Fire District are scheduled to adopt the plan this evening. Once all the agencies adopt the plan, it will be finalized and submitted to FEMA and Cal OES. There will be annual updates to the plan that would begin in fall of 2022. Next slide, please. Thank you for your time. Mayor Combs and City Council, our team is available to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Henry and, and Ms. Nagaya for the presentation. Uh, and Ms. Chen, um, um, uh, City Clerk Heron, can we call for public comment? Yes, thank you, Mayor Combs. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on item N3, adopt resolution number 6686, approving the 2021 San Mateo County Multi-Jurisdictional Local Hazard Mitigation Plan, Please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine now. So this will be the final call for public comment on item N3. Seeing no hands raised, Mayor Combs, you may continue. Thank you, uh, uh, City Clerk Karen. Um, you know, I'll, I'll just kick it off by uh, expressing my, my gratitude to staff. I, I know that this uh, um, is not just pro forma and may seem that way, um, but, but there is a lot of work that goes into this and, and, and I know lots of time and effort um, has been spent. And so uh, I wanted to ex express my, my, my gratitude uh, for, uh, for, for that. Um, and, and appreciate that this is certainly a, a necessary element, um, not just in, in connection with, um, or, or not simply about certainly um, understanding our, our, our risk and the threat, but also in, in, again, putting us at a position to be able to, to compete for additional dollars to, to, to mitigate uh, some of these risks and threats. And so again, my hat's off to staff for their work on this. Um, Council colleagues, uh, questions, comments. Vice Mayor Nash is right next to me, so she. So I, I turned to her, and I can't see Councilmember Muir, Councilmember Taylor. So she's been in the hot seat for for the evening, and I, I appreciate it. Yeah, Vice Mayor Nash. Thank you, Mayor Combs. Um, I have two questions. 
And that's um, in the staff report, it says that the safety element and the environmental justice element may consider incorporating the Cal Enviro screen. I'm wondering um, if I can get a little bit more explanation of that. Um, why would we not incorporate it? And I guess um, just generally for the public also, perhaps a uh, description of the Cal Enviro screen, please. Thank you, Vice Mayor Nash. Um, let me try to put some additional information up on the screen in response to your question. Um, so I think that should be, be up in just a second. Um, but in short, uh, kind of in, in parallel with the city's kind of ongoing work on the housing element, one of the, the additional steps will be updating the city's safety element uh, kind of concurrent with that. Uh, so that work is underway um, as well as creation of an environmental justice element. Um, so I think that in short, the, there are a number of different screening criteria that uh, can be used to determine whether or not a city is required to conduct a, um, uh, create, excuse me, a, an environmental justice element and Cal Enviro Screen is one of those, uh, but there are also several others. So I think as part of the safety element, it's my understanding that we'll be looking at um, the, the data and the metrics that are uh, included in Cal Enviro Screen. It's just a matter of how uh, it then kind of informs the, the safety element uh, process as I understand it. So essentially, um, you will be looking at the Cal Enviro screen um, and determining whether or not it should be incorporated, but it will be reviewed as part of those, um, the environmental justice and safety element. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, I think we, we understand the, the importance and we've, we've heard this, this comment th through, through um, out the safety element as well as the, the local hazard mitigation plan um, development process. So I, I think it's it's definitely a data source that we'll be be referring to and, and a number of the maps and information that the safety element team has has shared in, in their public outreach process so far have, have incorporated Cal and virus screen data. Thank you. Council Member Taylor. Thank you, Mayor Combs. And I just wanted to follow up on Vice Mayor Nasser's question. And, and thank you, Ms. Nagaya. Um, just want to find out, well, can we just take out, may consider, and just put incorporate the Cal Enviro screen? Because it, it doesn't sound like that it, it makes a difference because you'll be using this information and some additional information as well. Yeah, I think that's something we can raise with the, the safety element folks. Um, I am, am not overseeing that process, so I am hesitant to, to be able to commit to you tonight in exactly what form it will be in the safety element, but it has been kind of looked at as, as part of the, the process. So I, I think um, we can verify that as part of um, uh, the um, LHMP and then the, certainly the safety element scope coming forward. I don't think there's language in the LHMP itself um, that uses that language. If that's what you're asking to, to update, it, it's in the, um, uh, the slide in, in, in front of you as well as in the staff report, but that was our, our summary of the, the, the item, not the language in the LHMP itself. The reason I'm I'm asking is because I'm I'm very familiar with the the Cal Enviro screen. It's actually what I use as my background, and I'm concerned that the environmental justice piece isn't the isn't rooted in the local hazard mitigation plan, and so some information will be in one document, some information will be in the other, and then also because of the ordering the hazard mitigation plan is coming first and then the safety element and then the environmental justice piece. So I'm concerned about the ordering. I believe that it all should be rooted, both documents in the environmental justice. And so, so I'm just trying to, 
ensure that the documents are going to be linked and they also have some really pertinent information. The Cowling virus screen talks a lot about asthma rates, talks about the pollutants in the air. Um, it has information in there that I don't know where we're using it as a city. So I just wanna make sure that that is a part of the hazard mitigation plan since this is not a mandate, right? The hazard mitigation plan is not a mandate. Is that correct? So, well, there, there are state laws that require uh, that we adopt the LHMP, and especially as it relates to them being eligible for, for funding from certain sources um, related to uh, hazard mitigation, pre-disaster mitigation grants of uh, sources from FEMA. So it's not mandated in the same way the safety element is mandated uh, by the um, by the state law in context of the general plan update. But um, there, there are uh, requirements that, that come along with the LHNP. And so going back to my concerns, it's just making sure that a part of what we're adopting actually has an, an element of environmental justice in there so that there can be, I guess, operationalized change um, with mitigations. Um, I have not seen, at least I don't have it in front of me, the annual report um, of the 2016 local hazard mitigation plan. I don't know if any of that was actually operationalized in the general plan. Um, I'm not sure, but moving forward, I'm trying to make sure that it is. And so, um, which is why I asked the question. So I'm not sure if you have any suggestions or thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you, Councilmember Taylor. Um, so I think in the context of the data and the information that was used in the local hazard mitigation plan, we, we certainly heard your, your comments uh, when we brought forward the August uh, informational item about the LHMP and then as well from, from other members of the, the public that wrote in at that time um, about the importance of Cal and virus screen. And so we, we did look back um, through the, the process um, the county went through. And there were, at the time the LHMP was being developed and that baseline data being gathered, the current version of the Cal and virus screen was not yet completed. So it's currently uh, version 4.0 is the most recent. And that wasn't released until after uh, the kind of background data was gathered by the county for that the LHMP document. So they through kind of the the equity lens that Mr. Henry described earlier, what the county reviewed um, as part of that that process was a, a tool from FEMA, uh, the social vi social vulnerability index, um, as part of um, reviewing all the actions in the LHMP. So it's. I think we've uh, shared previously, we, we can definitely look at incorporating Cal and Virosgreen into future updates um, in that annual process for the LHMP as we go forward so that then there, there is information across both documents that's that is then consistent, uh, excuse me, both documents being the safety element of the general plan and the, the LHMP uh, going forward. So I, I think that's something that we can certainly look at um, as we move into future updates of the, the LHMP. Um, and then your question about updates on the 2016 uh, LHMP document. Uh, so that was reviewed annually by staff and updates were transmitted uh, to the, the group at the county kind of managing those, those updates. Um, I understand the county um, will have a more robust update process in the next five-year cycle. Uh, so if there's something uh, that the council would like to see in terms of an annual report or uh, as, as we go through each of those updates uh, on, on the, uh, that annual fall timeline, we could bring forward an update to the council at that point uh, to share kind of the results and progress that we've made over the, the year uh, that had passed. And I think um, as we talked a little bit about in the last agenda item and then uh, mentioned here as well, um, there's the potential for some additional resources related to climate resiliency that will be before you at the December meeting and getting those resources in place will help us 
uh, be staffed with, with um, folks that have some expertise in this area and, and dedicated time to, to spend on it as well. And so that will help, I think, some of the uh, action plan items that have been done uh, with this recent. Thank you. I, I have a, a couple other questions. Well, first, I would really like to see an annual reporting done. And I'm not sure if there, if this was an informational item, the annual update um, that was put on a council agendas. Um, but I definitely would like to see um, an annual reporting. Um, my other comment is the in order to get the, the BRIC grant, um, there were seven different areas um, that you could apply for. Um, I'm thinking specifically around communications and communications infrastructure. Do we have a citywide standard um, for communications and infrastructures? And I'm thinking in terms of hazard mitigation, the reason I'm asking. Yeah, um, that's a good question. So I think um, in terms of the, the different categories that you can apply for brick, brick funding for, um, I, I know there were, there were multiple different um, topic areas for which a, an agency could apply. I, I don't know the seven off, off the top of my head, um, but I, I trust the communications and infrastructure is, is one of them. Um, I'm not sure though, um, without looking into the program further, if communication is referring to communication in terms of public outreach and education, um, or if it's referring to uh, communication infrastructure, uh, like um, the small cell wireless and, and other kind of um, uh, electronic um, and communication facilities that might exist um, because the BRIC program was designed for um, you know, protection of communities and infrastructure is the, the IC in the program uh, in terms of the abbreviation BRIC. Um, so it's something that we could certainly look into a, a little bit further, um, but we, we didn't look at any kind of communication infrastructure and facilities as part of a, a BRIC application. Um, but I, I think if I'm understanding your question, you're, you're looking more for um, communication as in engagement and, and outreach um, information. Actually both. Uh, um, it's communication infrastructure because there's challenges around that um, as far as connectivity, um, specifically um, around District 1. And then also the outreach, I see it as two different pieces. Um, I would like to see that we invest more resources in doing outreach. Um, if we rely on one organization, I think they were funded actually by the county, um, but I think the city needs to take some leadership in doing outreach and investing in it, some additional resources to make sure um, that we're doing all that we can um, to get education out to our residents. So I'm thinking of it both, the communication infrastructure and um, outreach. Great. Thank, thank you for, for clarifying that. That's tremendously helpful um, to understand what, what, what you're looking for. I think um, there are also a number of other state programs that were put in place with the last budget cycle around um, programs to help with uh, digital connectivity um, challenges uh, across the state. So there may be some additional funds coming either through uh, the county or the city uh, that we could look at accessing for for programs to help with um, uh, internet access and, and communications infrastructure in, in that sense. Thank you for clarifying. You're welcome and, and thank you. I definitely am interested in that. And the county did receive funding um, several months ago, but the funding went to North Fair Oaks and East Palo Alto. So I would like to see the city actually take the leadership there since the county um, most folks look to the county. So if that's possible, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Taylor. Um, are there any additional questions or comments from, from Council on this agenda item? Or is, is there... Uh, Councilmember Taylor, did you raise your hand 
again? Or did yes. Okay, Mary. One, one last question, thank you. Sure. Um, and that is, was the, the, the draft printed um, so that there was a copy available for the public to have um, on display at the libraries? Yes, thank you, Councilmember Taylor. I don't know off the top of my head. Give me, give me a minute. We can can try to verify whether there was a printed copy. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Either way, once it's adopted, if you could print one and, and put them in the libraries, that would be great. Yeah, we can verify with library staff, but I'm pretty sure uh, there wasn't not one. Uh, printed and made available in either of the libraries, but having the approved plan available in the library is a great idea and we can do that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Council Mayor Taylor and Mr. Henry. Um, so um, if I don't, uh, since I don't, I don't see uh, any other uh, council comments, I'll uh, make a motion to adopt resolution number 6666, approving the 2021 San Mateo County Multi-Jurisdictional Local Hazard Mitigation Plan. Um, I do wanna make sure to follow up with council member Taylor, whether there were some items you raised that you thought should be a part of a motion. I don't know, certainly staff has said that they will provide a copy in the, um, the, the libraries uh, going forward. I, I think we've, we've gotten <laughs> a commitment from that. So probably doesn't need to be a part of, of any motion, but, but I just wanted to check in um, to, to make sure that there wasn't any other items that you were looking at to be part of the motion. Thank you, Mayor Combs. Um, off the top of my head, I remember the annual reporting. Oh, and yeah, all right. And I actually wrote that down. <laughs> and then also the, um, if, if we can take the language out, may consider and just use the um, information from the Cal and viral screen. Well, well, um, is there, uh, Mr. Murphy, uh, uh, the um, the de deputy city manager is, is uh, go going to comment. Um. Uh, yes, uh, Justin Murphy, deputy uh, city manager. So I'd probably look for assistance from uh, Director Nagaya, but I believe that language is solely in the slide and potentially in yeah. the staff report, but I don't believe it's in the LHMP document. So the, I don't think there's anything to actually remove from what the council is looking to adopt, but uh, I think the council has clearly expressed some preference direction for as we pursue the environmental justice element and the safety element that we will be uh, using the Cal Enviro screen through that process. Don't know exactly how that's to be yeah. discussed through that process, but so I don't think there's anything the council actually needs to remove as part uh, of this action. As far as the, the may consider language, right? Because it, it doesn't it, it doesn't exist in anything that the council is actually approving because we're not approving the staff report. Correct. Correct. Okay. Um, okay. So, and then, but we're aligned on the annual reporting. Correct. That, that, that's fine. Okay. Okay. Um, or, and d does that, does that work for you, council member Taylor? Yes. And the last item is the, the community engagement or community outreach. Um, I'm not sure if the city um, spent resources with the outreach group. I know the county did, but just looking at um, that we, sh I think we should be putting um, financial resources into outreach. Deputy uh, City Manager Murphy, so, um, cause is that something we, so council member Taylor has expressed that desire um, city manager Jerome Robinson. And, and uh, deputy city manager Justin Murphy can help me if needed, but I, I think we can take that to heart. I think as we move forward on the um, safety element and the environmental justice element, I understand exactly what uh, council member Taylor is requesting. 
and we can we can bring some funding options to the to the council. Okay, regarding that community outreach. Right. Yeah. Regarding community outreach. Okay. okay. So then, um, okay. So so then we have a motion. Is there a, a second from the vice mayor? Thank you. So I have a motion on the floor by Mayor Combs and a second by Vice Mayor Nash to adopt resolution number 6686, approving the 2021 San Mateo County Multi-Jurisdictional Local Hazard Mitigation Plan, Volume 1, Planning Area, Wide Elements, and Volume 2, City of Menlo Park Annex Plan, to also direct staff to provide annual reporting and to increase public engagement and outreach. Any further City Council question or discussion? Seeing none by roll call vote, City Council Member Mueller. Yes. Quickly, okay. uh, City Clerk Karen, re regarding the annual reporting, is uh, I think there's a de desire that that comes to Council, or is like, it, it, was that, I, I don't know if that was incorporated in, or, or is, it, is, is that understood? I can, in, I can include. Okay. To provide that to Council. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it is direct staff to provide annual reporting to the city council. Any further questions or discussion? I, I think that's it. Okay. Thank you. Of course. By roll call vote, city council member Mueller. Yes. City council member Taylor. Yes. Vice Mayor Nash. Yes. Mayor Combs. Yes. And the motion passes with city council member Willison absent. Thank you. All right, thank you city clerk Karen. Um, now we'll move on to the fourth item under regular business, uh, consideration of city council meeting uh, date to discuss the composition of the community engagement and route outreach committee and future uh, charge. Uh, here to introduce the item is city manager Starla Jerome Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and uh, council members. So uh, as I understand it, council member Taylor and vice mayor Nash introduced this um, request at last week's meeting. And so I think it falls into two overall buckets. One bucket would be an opportunity for SEAC members to meet with council to hear feedback from the SEAC group. And then secondly, how SEAC as, an, as a group will move forward. We, we would value their participation in the environmental justice element and the safety element to help us reach out to the community. Um, because as uh, noted earlier, that's an area that, that we can always do better at, and we, we would like the opportunity to reach as many people as possible. So with that said, um, I think it would also be helpful to explore uh, in, in that meeting what the, comp the composition of SEAC will be. It's currently has 13 slots of membership, but only eight are filled. And so in, uh, in our, in it, under the Brown Act, then we would need to have a quorum for any meeting with SEAC and that would require all eight members to attend because quorum is based on the number of slots or members, not, not, not those that are filled, but the entirety of it. So, um, so with that said though, I think uh, council member Taylor and uh, Vice Mayor Nash may be able to give additional feedback on this matter. All right. Okay. Th th thank you, uh, um, City Manager General Robinson. City Court Karen, can we call for public comment on this item? Yes, thank you, Mayor Combs. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on item N4, consideration of a city council meeting date to discuss the composition of the Community Engagement and Outreach Committee and future charge. Please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. For calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine now. So this will be the final call for public comment on item N4. And our first speaker will be Dan McMahon. All right, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. 
Outstanding. Hey, I, I just want to say uh, I, I applaud the uh, city council for taking this, uh, this topic and this, uh, the efforts uh, uh, taken by the COC, or the SEOC, as it was called. I just learned that today. Um, uh, so seriously, because I think the input and the quality of uh, what was uh, generated was very high. And so I think um, uh, additional time and effort should be put into uh, not only um, uh, getting feedback and looking to extend its charge to these uh, environmental justice and other uh, components of the element. Uh, so good work putting it on. Uh, I highly recommend um, uh, pushing the concept of SEAC beyond just doing housing element as well. Thanks. Thank you for your comment. Now this will be the final call for public comment on item N4. Seeing no further hands raised, Mayor Combs, you may continue. Thank you, uh, uh, City Clerk Heron. Um, so um, I'll I'll sort of kick off like where I, I think I'm, I'm at, or, or just a synopsis of of, of my my thinking. Um, on this, um, and then obviously, definitely interested in hearing from my my colleagues. Again, my understanding, based on my engagement with with the SEOC, um, uh, has been that there was some uh, degree of, of of discontentment with the limited purview of of the um, of, of the committee, and and it's essentially that it being limited to just sort of outreach and engagement. Um, and you know, I, I say that cautiously because I, I think that there has been some uh, um, uh, disagreement or, or some sort of differing of, 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 of opinions of, of conversations that, that have happened. Um, but I do think that, that some SEAC members even in, in the public and in the press statements have said that that, that, that was one of 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 the issues that that they had, and so I do think that that's that's worth um, worth noting and, and understanding um, as as we you know sort of uh, engage about like what moving forward looks looks like. Um, um, uh, you, you know, I remember I had a former boss who would always say, you know, look back but don't stare. Like right, as as a, there there has to be some value in understanding <laughs> where you've come from, but certainly don't don't um. Uh, don't linger there. There, they're too long. Not helpful in in in, um, in moving forward, and and so I, I think I'll take that same approach w w with this. Um, so, so I certainly think that there needs to be a, a council discussion uh, about where we go from here with the SEAC. Again, as it stands now, um, all members for there to actually be a future meeting with quorum, all of the members. Um, that are, are currently comprised the committee would have to attend. I, I do think that that's, that's a, 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 a tall order uh, um, in, in some cases, especially given like all the necessary staff time and prep time that would go into that, then, then to have that all dependent on 100% on attendance, I think would, uh, would, would be, um, uh, would be would be challenging and, and just so, sort of moving forward and engaging. Um, so I do think that there we need to sort of rethink um, how uh, this will be structured. This committee will be structured going going forward. Um, um, and, and I think that there are, there are sort of a number of options on on the table um, as far as like how we deal with this next. I think the the what's up in the air is is whether we deal with this as part of relooking at um, the housing element or the the next um, the next time we take up the, the the housing element as one of the agenda items, or whether we sort of add this as an agenda item to a future regular city council meeting. Um, for me, what's not on the table is a special meeting specifically to talk about the SEAC. Um, uh, I, I don't. I don't think that that's that's necessary. I don't think that there's a pressing time issue that um, that would require that. And so, and so that's where I am as as um, I, I look at. It. And again, as far as like how to approach it going forward, I, I think I can be open to uh, 
a bunch of different approaches, but, but I, I do think um, that there needs to be some, some change there. Uh, and, and I'll uh, acknowledge the city manager and then, and then go around the, to the council colleagues. Sorry, I just left my light on. I, I think that all makes sense. Oh, okay, all right. So, um, so is there? I, I know. Again, I, I guess I'll defer to the vice mayor and council member Taylor on on their thoughts on on um, on best next steps. Council member Taylor. Thank you, Mayor Combs. Um, and and essentially, you you said it all. Um, one of the reasons why I um, asked for this uh, the SEAC and the housing element. Um, to be discussed in one meeting is because they're connected. Um, and it, for me, it doesn't make sense to, to treat them differently. Um, the, it, as far as the SEAC, I just think there, there's potential to establish some best practices moving forward. Um, and that there's already been good work that has been done. And so hopefully that can continue um, with the fuller discussion on what that would look like. And Vice Mayor Nash, I didn't know if you wanted to add anything. Yeah, if I could, before we put, put you a little on the spot now. So currently, Council Member Taylor, um, the SEAC has no um, members representing District 1. Um, so obviously, when we uh, created this, and um, there, there was value seen in having all of the districts represent it. So do you have an idea for how we should resolve that issue? Yes. Do you want me to elaborate on that now? Yeah, I think if, if the city attorney says that you can elaborate on it now, it is kind okay. of a device, but okay. So, so yeah, so, so yeah, please elaborate on it now. Um, so I have been in contact with the two District 1 representatives um, since the since the SEAC was formed. Um, and they shared with me uh, their experiences. And I believe that there needs to be some established best practices um, moving forward um, without getting into any specifics. Um, but I do think that there is um, more that the council can do policy-wise to make sure that that actually happens. And so then in your communication with those two members, did they express a desire if these best practices were enacted to rejoin um, the, the committee or, or, or not? Um, I did not ask um, because I wasn't sure at that time where where all of this was. Um, and just in light of what was in the paper, all the emails back and forth, um, it is just, it's taken me a little time to digest it because if we don't do something differently around best practices, then we're gonna get less people participating on any type of advisory body with the city. So, which is why I would like to put some effort into it to make some changes um, if we can. Um, okay, then, yeah, yeah, I can uh, speak from personal experience about all of the emails <laughs> back and forth. Um, and, and so, but so let's say that those two members don't want to rejoin. What would be your, do you think that the SEAC, would you be comfortable in the SEAC continuing without District 1 being represented? No. Okay, so then you would want a process by which new members are appointed. I'm not sure if that would be necessary. I, I think if, if we make some changes, it's possible that the two members that resigned would come back. Mm -hmm. I don't know because I haven't asked, but that is my hope. Okay, so that's your hope. I, I just wanna go, you know, sort of sketch out for, for staff, what are the likely scenarios given um, certain uh, um, certain things transpiring. So um, even if even if um, they agree to come back, they still have to be reappointed um, because they have officially resigned, and and that does mean something. Um, and so um, it's you know these, these things aren't just sort of like sort of clubs where we can you know let people back in after they resign. That there is a, a process they have to be reappointed by the council, but. That would certainly make it easier um, if they express a desire to be reappointed. Um, uh, 
the uh, but then if if they don't, then it, it is clear that from your perspective that th that it would be problematic for SIOC to to continue without any representation of District One, and so then your preference would be some process by which we um, uh, um, appoint new members uh, um, in and have new representatives from from District One. Um, so. Yes. Okay. Totally fair. All right. So we're cool. We're, we're cool there. Um, uh, Vice Mayor Nash. Well, I guess the only thing I would add to what has been stated is that the other intention of our request was to actually have a meeting on a Saturday where the community is um, more likely to be able to be involved and um, with the housing element and also realizing that there's a lot to, to be discussed before we can um, and just it whatever we can do to um, stay on the timeline realizing that we are we are under pressure to to make some decisions so i um, if i could respond to that i genuinely understand the desire for a saturday morning meeting to be to be open to the public uh, and at a, uh, it's not unconventional, but it's not a standard time to meet either. So the concern I have is that just given the holidays and the approaching Thanksgiving week, this could certainly set us back three or four weeks. And, and I am generally worried about that. Maybe there's an opportunity later in the process to have a Saturday morning meeting where people could participate that, that doesn't further delay our progress on the housing element. So just if I can follow up, so if we don't do the Saturday morning meeting, when would you see the the um, housing element uh, follow up meeting coming to council? Uh, we were hopeful that we could, uh, and I'm looking at uh, Deputy City Manager Murphy here, but I think we were targeting December 1st, if that was possible, which is a Wednesday evening. Okay. Um, so, so not a currently scheduled meeting, not it would be a, a special current, meeting. We were trying to put it together as a special meeting to give the council and the public a full opportunity to comment on the housing element. Um, the Vice Mayor Nash and then Council Member Mueller, I'll, I'll acknowledge you. Uh, my comment would be if, if we're going to do that, um, just absolutely as much public information up front as possible, you know, if we can be announcing it tonight or very soon that we will be doing that so that people can um, do whatever they can to make it if they're interested. If I may, we, we floated the idea of the date, but we haven't gotten confirmation on the availability of key players. So we, we would need that first, but then we will do everything we can to publicize the event so people are aware. Yeah, and I'll just add before I, um, go to council member Mueller. I, I do think I, um, as I think about it more, I, I share or I see the concern or the possible landmines uh, in including the SEAC as an item on uh, the follow-up meeting for, um, uh, for, for the housing element. I certainly see the efficiency or value in, in having it all happen there. And, and I do agree that it's related, um, but if, Part of the possibility is, is that we're going to be looking for some best practices as possibly being outlined by the members who resigned, um, of, of which we don't at this moment know exactly what that is. I, I just, I do have some concern that like, we really do have to have a limit to that discussion and engagement um, because then we do have actual elements of the housing element that we need to address to give um, staff the direction they need when it comes to sort of setting up and preparing the, the NOP. And, and so that, that is, that is, that is my, my, my concern. I am certainly willing to defer to my council colleagues and, and I see the, the value and efficiency in having it all together, but, um, but, but, but I can also see, see where, where there, where it might be problematic. If I may, Mr. Mayor, uh, thank you for that prompt. I, I am not sure we can pull together uh, best practices, you know, to, to completely understand how to cure some of the issues that um, occurred. 
So by December 1st, I mean, it's still gonna be a heavy lift to get the housing element material to the council and the public by, by that date. And so, uh, but I, I do think we, so I guess it would be helpful tonight to understand from the council whether it's a go, no go. It has to be a joint, uh, not a joint meeting, but a meeting that has both agenda items on it, or if we could include an item with SEAC at a future council meeting. Okay. Uh, Council Member Mueller. Yeah, I, so uh, where I am on this is, uh, so what I, what's not clear to me is what, so with respect to SEAC, my understanding from the past is that operationally that there was a, a task uh, associated with the housing element that the SEAC was, was tasked with fitting into the puzzle framework of what all of the housing commission was tasked with and the planning commission was tasked with and what we were tasked with and staff was tasked with. And so, and that was all within an operational timeline. And now for better or for worse, actually we just, uh, we're further down that timeline. And so I don't, I'm, I don't know what SEAC, I, I don't know how we back that timeline up uh, to go ahead and sort of redo that task. And I don't, I'm not even sure that's what's being proposed. If we're not backing the timeline up to redo that task, if what we're doing instead is looking at operationally where the deficiency was, I think that's appropriate, but I don't know if like doing it while we're still within the constraints of the timeline uh, is really the most efficient thing because we just have to, we have to make all those other piece, puzzle pieces come together. So I think it's important to get feedback that perhaps we didn't get that, that relates to that task. Uh, you know, obviously anything that they have from the community that they've collected uh, we we want to get that put into the process, but breaking down where their where where the you know the operation of doing their task fell apart. I'm not sure right now makes is the best use of staff time and our time, but I do think we need to do it. Um, so, and I would support. I actually think doing a meeting on a weeknight where it was the only agenda item would probably give us greater participation than a Saturday morning. Uh, Saturday mornings, I think, are pretty difficult for young families and for families with kids and activities. Whereas uh, a weeknight uh, starting a little bit, you know, around six o'clock and going into the evening, most people can usually try to make that work. So, but it would want to be the only agenda item on the item, on the, uh, on the calendar that you, so that's, those are where my thoughts are, but happy to listen to the rest of counterpoints any of you might have. Uh, thank you, Council Member Mueller. So I wanna so get some sense of where the council is r regarding the requirement that um, uh, the housing element sort of um, follow-up meeting and the SEOC meeting uh, be combined. Is 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 that a requirement uh, from uh, the, the the council? Uh, for me, like I, I was, I said, I, I do see the efficiency and value in in, in tackling them both, but um, I, I also uh, get uh, have some sense that it, it would constrain and limit our ability to um, uh, really sort of address some of the linear issues regarding the housing element that the council needs to do. Um, as a requirement uh, for, for for the next phase, and so it certainly is is not a, a deal breaker to me that we um, we handle the the housing element uh, follow up meeting and then uh, the the SEAC be an agenda item um, for a future a future council meeting. But I want to hear where um, where my council colleagues are on this issue. Uh, Council Member Taylor. Thank you, Mayor Combs. Uh, 
I, I see the, the SEAC as being a, essential to the housing element um, and the housing element process. Um, and without being specific about whatever challenges happened, because I wasn't in the rooms um, with the SEAC, it, it to me, I believe we need to put some effort into helping it work um, so that the housing element and the SEAC can work cohesively together. There's been a lot of talk around the safety element and environmental justice. I don't see that happening unless we put some extra effort into um, creating a working community engagement group so that it can be effective and efficient in its role. And it doesn't seem like that happened. The fact that we had three surveys due on one day, which added a layer of confusion. And so, and that is not a best practice. I see value having both in one meeting because we need one to do the other. They go hand in hand. Um, but if people are uncomfortable with that, I'm okay with that too. To um, where are you at, uh, <laughs> Vice Mayor Nash? Uh, so I agree basically with everything that's been said. I think that SEAC is critical to having, um, to going forward with the housing element, with the safety and the environmental justice portion. I think that um, we've got to get out of the gate with the NOP. And if the two of those items cannot um, be in the same meeting, and I do understand that um, they're both probably going to be more um, longer items, more intense items. And so I think that um, it's very important to proceed with both. I, didn't, I think it's fine to separate them. Um, but we need to commit to making sure that we're doing both in a very timely way. Um, and I do believe that, um, you know, if we have to put one horse in front of the other, it's definitely the NOP is the one that we just have to get done, um, but that we really cannot lose sight and the, um, just the working relationships with the SEAC. Council Member Mueller, and then I'll, I'll go to the city manager. So I don't have any problem at all working with the SEAC on substance based, on a substance based discussion related to their work. But what I don't want to do is get into a discussion about procedural defects and what's happened in the past. Like if there's, if there's content that they have for subject matter, you know, feedback that they have that's required by the process, then we need, and, and it hasn't been captured, then I'm completely fine with setting aside the time to bringing them in and getting that captured as required for the housing element. But, where I, but, but if, the, if the conversation diverges to, we're gonna talk about procedurally you know, best what the best practice should be for a SEAC and, and what the procedural defects have been with respect to the SEAC. I don't wanna, I don't, I don't think it's productive at this time when we're trying to get across the finish line to start taking apart the past. We can do that in a future meeting and I'm not uncomfortable, you know, doing that in a future meeting, but I just don't want it to be, I don't want us to get sidetracked while we're trying to hit this deadline. So, and I think it, and I, I worry that if we do get sidetracked in that, that it will, uh, it could derail us from moving forward with the, with the tasks that, we're, that we have to get done under this deadline, that, which is why we put together the process. I think um, 
something that we all should have said first is just acknowledge how much work the SEAC has done and um, how important the community effort is and community outreach is in this whole process. And I especially want to shout out to Vicki Robledo, who went door to door in District 1, um, talking to residents, um, going through the, a long survey with them to get answers. And just the amount of dedication, the amount of effort um, that members have put in is really um, remarkable. And I think that we need that dedication and commitment going forward, especially to reach um, some of our more vulnerable residents um, in all districts and you know, especially in district one. Um, we need to, I think we do need to do some introspection, not to dwell on anything, but we do need to heal um, and we need to figure out what would be helpful to the community um, to, which will, in my mind, it is, and I believe it was in the staff report, it's probably getting a, some a community-based organization engaged um, and um, with people truly who are in the community now who already have the trust of residents and to have them engaged in this process. So I guess, um, again, we have to get the NOP out, the, out of the gate, but we also really have to get back um, to a more cohesive working relationship. Um, I like what Mayor Combs said with the uh, um, look back, but don't stare. Um, I'd never heard that before and I, I think that's perfect. Um, but I do think that there, there is some information that needs to be gathered about um, which would be productive as far as going forward. What, as council member Taylor said, what are best practices? How do we do this? Um, we cannot expect to have a, a quality um, document, which is what we absolutely need as part of the housing element beyond requirements without the community participating. Thank you, Vice Mayor Nash. Uh, Council Member Mueller, I see your, your hand is, is, is up. I don't know if it's a holdover or if you had an additional comment you wanted to make. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to have it raised, but I'll just comment. Look, I you know, if Council decides it wants to go forward and just do all of this at one time, it's fine. I just would like staff to give us what the timeline looks like in terms of getting all of that accomplished. So I think it's, you know, I think it's fine. Like I don't have an objection to it. I just am very concerned about the constraint on calendar because Thanksgiving's next week, uh, which we, I think we lose a lot of. And uh, we're rapidly uh, going into December uh, when a lot of this is done. So I just don't, I don't, I guess it's kind of hard because I don't know really how far, how far the process, I don't, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not clear how much time that we're talking about putting back into the process as a result of what's being requested. So if, if I can get, some, if we can get some more framework about what that looks like in terms of, because if we have that meeting uh, on the Saturday and it's with best practice and we find, we do uh, a best practices discussion and we bring in a community a stakeholder organization, then we are gonna to need to, then what's the, what comes after that in terms of what actions that are gonna be taken so that people are comfortable with the work product and how much time uh, should we bake in after that to go ahead and follow up on all of that. So then every, everything is collected and uh, everything's put in the position that people want it to be for the NLP. So I, I'm not, I'm not objecting to any of it. I'm just, I just want to, I'm just trying to understand what this mean, what this looks like in terms of calendar. So I can, 
try to make a decision as to whether or not we actually have the time. So I guess it's just, that's, that's my difficulty. I'm having a hard time understanding what comes next. And is there an expansion of what the SEAC is going to be doing? Uh, or could there be an expansion of what the SEAC uh, was doing initially to something more? Like what, I mean, what are we, what's, what's really being contemplated? Well, if I may, I, I don't think we have all the answers tonight, but I, I do think there's, uh, I think both of these issues are important, but I think they have different timelines. I think the NOP is, uh, time is of the essence right now. And I think SEAC, we, we do want to work with them, but if we're to develop best practices, that's not going to happen overnight. And it's not going to be February either. We need to make sure that we keep moving on it. And, and I want to be respectful of what that process looks like. But from, from the staff perspective, I think it's important that we move forward with the council direction on the NOP by you know early to mid-December in SEAC. We can try and bring back in that same time frame, but it, it just, I think it's important and we want to do it right. And if we need to bring in some additional resources and depth, then I want to make sure that we're trying to hit that bell as well. So I, I don't know if that helps the council, but that would be my proposal. And we can certainly reach out in the, tomorrow or the day after to try and find a calendar for the council when, when there's availability and the staff and city attorney so that we, and we can give you a firmer idea about specific dates at that point. Thank you, uh, City Manager Jerome Robinson. And I do think that there is a general sort of consensus and not like I can make a, a motion to the extent necessary um, uh, that it certainly sort of prioritizes, obviously, uh, bringing back the, the follow-up to the housing element um, and, and not requiring it to, to be combined with the SEAC, but then that should also come back as soon as, as possible. And I am, what I do want to say, and somewhat following up on, on what uh, Council Member Mueller has said in that, um, like, again, what will be the framing of, of this discussion? And, and my engagement with the SEAC is that um, we shouldn't, you know, endeavor to put a framing on it. <laughs> they will come and, and express it, um, you know, ex express their opinions and concerns about a wide ranging uh, of issues as it relates to this process. And I will say that like in defense of myself who has been in the middle of, of, of a lot of this, the issue was not just about best practices or best practices not being followed. It was about an expressed desire to do something outside of what were the guidelines of the committee. And so, and, and that was that engagement. Um, it was not that something wasn't being done in the best way. It was an expressed desire to do something different than as it had been constructed. And that's fine. And you can make that point. And, and maybe in that first engagement, what I as a member of the subcommittee should have done is to, should have brought this back to council and said, hey, there is an expressed desire for this committee to do a lot more than, than outreach. Um, in engagement. And so, but, but it was not about an absence of best practices, at least of the extent to with my engagement. It, it was based express uh, very specifically on a desire to do something outside of, of what the, the confines that, that the council had set for the committee. And so, and I do think that that is, that is important to take into any additional discussions on, on this topic. Um, but again, my motion would be that, um, that to direct that the staff to, um, again, like I say, prioritize first um, uh, scheduling a follow-up meeting for, for the housing element, that if possible, that that can be combined with an additional item uh, on, on the SEAC, but that that is not necessary. And then if they cannot be scheduled together, um, um, that, 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 the, that the SEAC should be uh, added as an agenda item to a future council meeting as soon as, as possible. Is there a second? Okay. Uh, Vice Mayor Nash has seconded. 
Thank you. I have a motion on the floor by Mayor Combs and a second by Vice Mayor Nash to direct staff to prioritize scheduling a housing element meeting, if possible, combined with the Seahawk discussion, if not to add the Seahawk to a future agenda as soon as possible. Any further city council discussion or question? Uh, Vice Mayor Nash. Just to state what I think is the obvious, and that's to, we need to make sure that the SEAC is available for um, and well noticed for whenever they're anticipating. Thank you. Just really quickly, I want to, I see Council Member Mueller hand is raised, and so uh, I'll acknowledge him. But we do have a, a motion on the floor. <laughs> so. yeah, I just wanted to express. After, and then after Council Member Mueller, Council Member Taylor. I just wanted to just express it's this was an unusual item for me to have two council members on a subcommittee working on an issue and then two council members not on the subcommittee bringing an item on the same issue. So it's just uh, it's this one has been tricky to navigate and I appreciate everyone's uh, attempt to do so, uh, but I it, it hasn't happened too often in my time on council that there were two members of the subcommittee working on an issue and then two members external to that brought something on the same subject item. So uh, you guys all handled it gracefully, uh, but it was, it was unusual and difficult to navigate as being the fifth person. <laughs> uh, council member Mueller, I wish I could have been that fifth person. <laughs> <laughs> Council Member Taylor. Thank you, Mayor Combs. I, I, my, my only comment is uh, just to ensure that the SEAC will not be meeting. Yes, it, the, the SEAC will, will not um, be meeting in, until the Council takes this item back up. I, I think it's unlikely that the SEAC can make quorum, um, uh, but, but yeah, that there, there won't be any scheduled SEAC meeting. Thank and so you. that doesn't need to be part of the motion, but that, that is, that is de definitely the case. Okay. So, so city for Karen, you can continue. Yes, thank you. So any further city council question or discussions? Seeing none by roll call vote, city council member Mueller. Yes. City council member Taylor. Yes. Vice Mayor Nash. Yes. Mayor Combs. Yes. And the motion passes with city council member Willison absent. Thank you. I right, thank you, uh, City Clerk Heron. Uh, turning now to informational items. Um, informational items are transmitted to the City Council and the staff's effort to provide an update on matters of importance to the City Council. Informational items are not action items. However, a City Council member, City staff member, or a member of the public may request to make a comment or ask a question on any of the informational items. Um, City Clerk Heron, can you call for public comment on the informational items? Yes, thank you, Mayor Combs. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on our informational items, O1 regarding city council agenda topics, or O2 responses to questions from city council members on the housing element update, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you are calling in from a landline or a cell phone, you may press star nine now. This will be the final call for public comment on our informational items 01 and 02. Seeing no hands raised, Mayor Combs, you may continue. All right, thank you, City Clerk Heron. And are there any council questions or comments on the informational items? Uh, seeing none, then we will uh, go on to uh, city manager's reports. Um, was it on, is it off? Um, so thank you, uh, Mayor Combs. I, the only announcement I had tonight was I just wanted to, um, I think you, we all know that there was a rail subcommittee meeting scheduled for Monday evening at five o'clock, which we canceled um, for a variety of reasons, but we will be rescheduling that meeting in the next three to four weeks. So I just wanted to make sure the public was aware that it's on our radar to reschedule it uh, and it would be sooner except for the holidays. So we will be doing that in the near future. All right, uh, thank you, uh, City Manager Jerome Robinson. Um, we'll turn now to uh, City Council Member reports. Um, and I have a, f a couple, 
Um, so uh, I'll start off with the announcement that um, we, we will be doing a, a state of the city uh, uh, um, address this year as a, as a town hall. So a short address with a Q&A. Um, and initially I, I had wanted it to be a city, state of the city email, um, but, but uh, some people uh, talked me out of that. And so, so that, and that will be scheduled for November 30th, right? Okay, so, so November 30th. Um, also, we, we will be doing a, 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 um, a much scaled down uh, tree lighting uh, 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 ceremony this, this year. Um, obviously, we did ultimately decide to, to light the tree at Fremont Park last year, um, but it was late in the season, and I think we just we, we just just strong, had the lights strong and, and turned on. So we will do, like I say, a, a scaled down a version this year, um, and then uh, uh, we're still sort of finalizing an exact date. Um, the second thing, as speaking uh, as a member of the Housing Element Subcommittee. I did want to give uh, council again uh, just a, a, a heads up on this and that like the scope and the work of uh, the consultants has expanded and so there will be uh, a fees associated with that engagement in excess of what was not budgeted but what was um, it will still in theory be under the budgeted amount but not under the initial sort of um, projections. Uh, I don't know if I'm saying that right. Uh, contract. The contract. And so I did want to give the city council, um, you, you know, some some early update on that. So and th that will um, obviously you, you, you'll you'll see that, but but didn't want anyone to be to be to be surprised there. And, and again, th that will will be fully explained. Um, and then the, the the last thing I wanted to, to say um, uh, in, in council member reports is that you know, I I would like the council or at least someone on council to support scheduling a, an agenda item where we address the NTMP projects that are currently um, in stasis or purgatory. I don't know what, what they are. And so obviously the NTM, NTMP, the Neighborhood Traf Traffic Management Plan, which again is a process by which residents get to propose um, uh, traffic or, or, or uh, transportation infrastructure changes as it relates to neighborhood streets. Um, it, it has been has been paused for staffing and resources issues. Um, and so no new um, projects are being accepted. But I do think that there are a number of or at least a few projects um, that were in process that were paused and uh, I think it's not clear what we're telling those residents where that is. And so I would like um, to schedule a, an agenda item where uh, the, the council gets some visibility into what's, what's there and what it takes to move those along or, or not move those along. And I want that separate from a discussion about what to do <laughs> with the NTMP because I know that there are varying um, uh, there's a lot of thinking on that, which I think is, is valid. But but I do think separate from that is 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 the the projects that are in some process there. And so I would like um, uh, some council member to support me on that. I see that uh, council member Mueller and and uh, uh, Taylor's hands are, are raised. Um, I, I don't know if it's to make their own council reports or to um, or, or, or to um, support that item, but but I'll go to Council Member Taylor first, and then and then Council. Th those are all of my my council my council member reports. So I'll go to Council Member uh, Taylor. Thank you, Mayor Combs, and yes, my hand is raised to support your request. Thank you. I, I appreciate it very much. Um, and so okay, so, so then yeah, again, and that re request would be just again like at a, at a future date. Um, that, that we bring, uh, um, we we um, ha have an agenda item. We can look into those 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 items. Um, Council Member Mueller. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Combs. So um, I have no problem sharing with Council. I had my booster shot today at the convention center, and I did not have an appointment. Uh, they take non appointments there, and it was a it was a. They are doing a very good job of handling people coming in and out and moving them through. Uh, and so I really encourage people uh, to go get their boosters. It's open to, to all adults over age 18 now. And 
I uh, wanted to take a moment to talk to the council and it's not my district and I completely uh, yield uh, all expertise to council member Taylor, uh, but I did want to raise to the council sooner than later the fact that with the community center gone, uh, I'm not sure how we should the, should the the effort be made to start bringing people to get uh, booster shots? How we how that will be accomplished? But I think we need to start planning on that now. Uh, COVID is raging in Europe again, and uh, we're expecting to have it uh, the incidence rate pick up dramatically in the United States here in in the winter holiday months, and that's why they have opened up. Uh, booster shots to everyone, but I'd, I'd rather not see a, a repeat in uh, in history in San Mateo County where we have some communities get their boosters and some communities lag behind. And so I really would like uh, really would like us and the city to, to spend some time thinking about how we can boost to those booster rates uh, now. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member Mueller. Um, Vice Mayor Nix, did you? Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll see no other. Uh, uh, um, sorry, Council Member Taylor. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Combs. So, just a, a reminder that tomorrow is Ruby Bridges Walk to School Day. Um, so, I hope. Um, you all will be participating in some way if you're able to. Um, and the other is to follow up on Council Member um, Mueller's um, discussion around um, boosters and space available um, at the farmers market on Sundays. And I cannot remember the contractor's name um, provides um, first, second or boosters um, in the community. Um, and then also there will be an Ask the Doc um, part two um, this Thursday um, that is for the community. Um, any, actually anybody um, can call in, can zoom in um, just to talk about uh, the boosters and where to get them and then comfort level as far as which one you want to you want to have. Um, but I do think that we need to be um, encouraging folks considering we're headed for another surge. And when we think about space and what's available um, specifically in District 1, there isn't a lot. Um, majority is outdoor space, um, but making sure that we are using that space in a way where it provides some type of service or resource to community members. Thank you. Um, thank you, Council Member Taylor, for the reminder about Ruby Bridges Walk to School Day and, and also for the additional information about um, the availability of, of COVID shots um, in the community. Um, so with that, Council Member Mueller, I see your hand is, is raised. I, I don't know if it's a holdover or, or if, um, oh, okay, you took it down. Okay, with that, I will adjourn the meeting for the evening and thank uh, Vice Mayor Nash for uh, joining me at, at, the, at the dais for, for the first time in over a year. <laughs> so, um, but that, that uh, the meeting is adjourned.